Cebu City. He's a lifetime member of the Philippine National Historical Society and is currently Secretary of the Executive Council of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, National Committee on Historical Research. Uh, Mr. Dr. Borinaga, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sir JP, for the uh, introduction. So allow me to uh, first share my screen. So is this uh, visible? Yes, sir. We can see your presentation. Thank you, sir. So uh, good day to everyone. Uh, I'm here to present on uh, the paper titled Welcome Magellan research. Lands in the Land of the Dead, uh, Mr. or uh, subtitled Hamonhon as Sacred Island of Ancient Isayan. So I have a short modification to the uh, subtitle. So rather than Warai, I'd like to focus on the Visayas in general, because a lot of the narratives, the uh, folkloric material I will be presenting uh, covers this wider area uh, that are now divided into different regions. So in terms of the questions, I'd like to answer the uh, following. So what role did the island of Monhon play during the Magellan Ilcano expedition's first circumnavigation of the world from 1519 to 1522? Second, why was Sumanhon uninhabited, according to Pigafetta, and subsequently called Isla Encantada during the early Spanish period? And lastly, uh, what was the impact of the Magellan Elcano's expeditions, 1521 Sumanhon landing on local beliefs and on early responses to Spanish colonization and Christianization? So I want to divide uh, my paper into uh, four parts. So first we'll discuss the encounter between uh, the Magellan expedition and uh, the inhabitants of Homonhon, oh, I mean of Suluan, who visited them in Homonhon uh, around uh, March 18 of uh, 1521. So second, I will discuss the uh, label of Isla Encantada uh, given to Homonhon during the early Spanish period. And third, I want to uh, discuss the impact of this uh, landing and the eight day stay of the expedition on the island on the local belief system. So we will examine narratives, not only from the Visayas, but also from Mindanao. And I will conclude my talk with some um, discussion on the implications of these folkloric materials. So I want to uh, synthesize not only the well-known chronicles like Pigafetta and early Spanish chronicles, but as mentioned, I want to link this with uh, folkloric narratives, <coughs> oral narratives, and uh, how they correspond to uh, frequent hazard. So the Philippines being one of the most hazard-prone countries on the world, so it has um, an impact on the narratives we tell ourselves, especially the mythology of uh, the people of the Visayas and the other parts of the Philippines. So Bangkok has uh, this uh, recent article which talks about about the shared experiences relatives with uh, the hazards that a certain local so in terms of Humanon significance to the Magellan expedition, so this has been widely uh, discussed in the uh, recent or the past year's uh, events, uh, centennial events, and uh, I will focus on Humanon and the other uh, localities that the Magellan expedition uh, passed through will be covered by uh, the rest of today's speakers. 
So as uh, we've learned from Pigafetta's account that the expedition had arrived in the area of Samar around uh, March 16, 1521, but uh, they did not land on solid ground until a day later. So it is said that they had uh, anchored overnight in Suluan. And in fact, uh, there was almost a an encounter or a meetup on that day, but the locals from a, on a boat in Suluan had uh, had escaped or gone away. So they were not able to meet these people. And they decided to land on the nearby island of Homonhon the next day on March 17. So what's interesting about uh, this encounter is that uh, Homonhon was uh, not a not just any island. So as we'll see later, it was quite central to the uh, culture and religion of the inhabitants of the area. So uh, Pigafetta mentions that it was uninhabited, but we'll see why that was uh, the case. So these are some of the details of the eight day stay in um, the island and uh, the fact that the Magellan expedition was able to get much needed provisions um, and a recovery time for their uh, exhausted fleet. So they had uh, incurred casualties in their Trans-Pacific voyage and they found um, abundant water in uh, Omonhon as well as food. So thus, Humanhon became known as uh, the watering place of good signs because it was not only uh, a source of much needed water, uh, but also they saw the first signs um, upon their meeting with the inhabitants of Suluan that uh, there was much gold in this area that they had arrived in. So they also noted uh, how the natives were quite friendly. So there was a chief that... Uh, greeted Magellan upon landing uh, on the 18th. Uh, and as Pigafetta noted, the people were friendly with them and received, and we received them with kindness, their kindness with pleasure because they seemed good and respectful. So it was a very cordial uh, early encounter between uh, the fleet and the first group of what we now call Filipinos to have uh, met the, and welcome the expedition. So as uh, you'll see below, there was some doubt about this encounter in the early uh, years or the early first century of Spanish rule. So Father Alcina, who we, we will hear from again later, okay, he doubted that this uh, meeting, at, at least as mentioned in the oral literature, had happened because as he mentioned, there was a very well-known tradition that the Spanish ships arrived in that island in the beginnings, as he called it. But there are evidence that uh, the Magellan expedition had indeed been there, as seen in these rock inscriptions close to uh, where the quincentennial marker is now situated. So the uh, group I will discuss, as mentioned, uh, includes not only the area the waray speaking areas of the Visayas, but also uh, other parts, especially Panay, where we will see some links between the narratives uh, in the eastern part of the Visayas with those on the opposite end. So some images here, I have some images from the Boxer Codex and Father Alcina. So second, uh, we'll now discuss why was uh, Humonhon uninhabited? So first, because it was considered a Diwata abode, and second, because uh, it seemed to have been regarded as a uh, land of the dead or a sort of spirit afterworld. So it, it was uh, Alcina who gave, uh, at least for recent historians uh, that gave context, why was Homonhon uninhabited? So basically he said uh, that the island was a sort of sacred water or uh, water with uh, curative apparently powers and uh, thus people went there uh, along with uh, the intention to pay homage to a certain Diwata. So we, they also got firewood which according to 
um, later accounts was quite uh, useful in their day-to-day -day, uh, activities and this was even used in deep diving. So it is said that uh, firewood from places like Komonhon could burn for a long time underground. So this would have been very useful in extracting mineral, uh, I mean, maritime resources uh, in this very uh, biologically diverse part of uh, Asia. So we also learned that Makapatag is the name given to the so-called owner and god of Homonohon. So it, according to Alsina and uh, to quote, the island was a celebrated one in their old times. They say that the people from nearby places would repair to it in pilgrimage to offer prayers to the Diwata, who they said had his abode there, and so that they he would grant them health, prosperous time, among others. So, and so, so they said that Makapatag was the son of Malaon, which is another name that we'll uh, see later on, lived on this island and is considered as the greatest of the Diwatas. So according to Alsina, uh, he was he likened Makapatag to Jupiter, which is the king of the gods or the god of sky and thunder of the Romans. So here are some pictures of uh, the resources that would have been uh, much uh, needed by the natives in going to the islands. So I say much needed because uh, according to the accounts, you needed to be brave in order to visit this island at that time, or at least at the Spanish contact. Because uh, as noted by uh, Alcina, so again, uh, it was the abode of Makapatag who uh, was synonymous also so there was another word malaon which they used to refer to um, a same deity or at least the uh, feminine aspect of that deity so the one whom they called malaon in the region of ibabaw so which is the northern and eastern part of samar so the side facing the pacific uh, is acknowledged as their supreme being so they also called malaon makapatag which is means he who sets everything in order and makes everything equal, a name by which they gave to understand the equality of divine justice. But this is a very uh, interesting uh, uh, etymology, uh, something that makes everything equal, which makes you uh, ask, so what does it refer to? So if we are to uh, look at the physical world, so what is its closest equivalent? So I would argue that um, it, this refers to typhoons. So the uh, descriptions provided by Alcina elsewhere is uh, quite striking in how it matches this uh, description of Makapatag as the great leveler, the great equalizer. Because uh, not only is it something that uh, uh, corresponds to Alcina's description of typhoons, so as uh, an event where whatever is visible and stands out somewhat perishes, and even the lowly, uh, no slowly being, even a worm, you know, is pulled down and destroyed by these very powerful you know, forces of nature, as we call them today. But at that time, it's arguable that these, these typhoons were seen as manifestations of the presence of the Diwata. And uh, even in uh, after Yolanda's 2013, so this was a term, uh, the great equalizer that was applied to Yolanda, which is similar to how Father Kobak, so the translator of uh, Alcina's manuscript in the 20th century, had also uh, put into words his uh, understanding of Alcina's description of Makapatag. So Humonhon, as uh, we are all quite familiar in terms of the patterns of typhoons in the Philippines, it's a uh, frequent uh, an area frequented by typhoons, so including Typhoon Yolanda and uh, two other strong typhoons in 1897 and 1912 that uh, caused storm, devastating storm surges. So we see here uh, a possible uh, link between Makapatag and natural phenomena such as typhoon. So we also see in uh, Father Kobach's clarification of the etymology of Makapatag, how Maka 
uh, somehow uh, denotes frequency. So someone or something that is fond of, so for for what the root word stands for, which is patag, so fond of leveling something. So there's connotations of repetition or frequency, just like the typhoons that frequent this uh, island. So we'll see also how uh, makapatag can be understood as an enabler. So we'll see the links be with, between this phenomena, typhoons, and the slave raiding that uh, is a well-known practice of the ancient Pintados or the ancient Visayas. So we have correlations in other parts of the world, how typhoons, uh, thunder, storms, okay, they are uh, linked to uh, deities, gods in other cultures. So even Yahweh, uh, the God in the Old Testament is uh, has been labeled as a storm and warrior deity who leads the heavenly army against Israel's enemies. So same with the Greeks and uh, with in Mexico, they, they also have uh, in among the Zapotecs, Kusiho, uh, and among the Japanese, you have um, Okami or Ura Okami, who is a Japanese dragon and Shinto deity of rainbow and snow, although probably not a uh, warrior deity. But in the Visayas, uh, I would argue that uh, Makapatag was, uh, is another name for Makando, which is mentioned by another early chronicler, uh, Miguel de Luarca, as one of three uh, main war deities that the Visayans or the Pintados invoke before going to war. So. Uh, Makapatag might have been a typhoon god and uh, another side of him was a war god of the Visayas. So this is the argument. And we can see uh, links between these uh, movements of the Watas at the Spanish contact with the movements of uh, giants in folk uh, literature. So oral narratives that have been recorded in more recent times so the folklorist couple, Don Hart and Harriet Hart, for instance, in the early post-war period, okay, they noted the uh, predominance or the ubiquity of this uh, story, myth cycle about Makaandog and his family. So this is actually available online, a very long article and also uh, very diverse in terms of the versions. So this is uh, something uh, which we will see also with, with the, with regard to the Diwatas, how their names, uh, the phenomena attributed to them, okay, there are also variations across this area. So just some example how uh, Alcina noted that there was a giant that crossed on foot from Limasawa to Panaon and then to Caraga, and how uh, Makaandog had a brother in Leyte, uh, and this is from the 20th century that he just uh, took a few steps and he went to his brother and lady to borrow the uh, coconut grater or kaguran in Pinaray. So it actually helped to explain in the folk uh, literature why these islands spoke the same language because they were inhabited by this uh, ancestral giant family. So these giants, uh, the movements attributed to them have similarities in how the movements of the Diwatas at the Spanish contact were also uh, told in their narratives. <clears throat> so say Chirino in 1610 had said that kapatag, which is uh, a derivative word for makapatag or a root word for makapatag, the son of Malaon, which again is interchangeable with Inilaon herself, so these two deities were somehow interchangeable, but in other versions, they were uh, mother and son, Laon the mother, Kapatag the son. So they are both considered as their greatest. So comes down with others from heaven and resides in an islet, I think near Dulag or Giguan or Giwan in the open sea, which, is, which the Spaniards call Isla Encantada. So there are two sources for the Isla Encanta, the name. So it's Alcina in the 1660s and Chirino uh, from the reports of the early Jesuit missionaries in uh, the Samar Leyte area. 
and compare this to Pocano's data from 1968 after he'd done field work in among the uplanders of Panay. So he says, Captain was the principal deity of the early Visayans, lived in Kahilwayan, so the upper world. And whenever he wanted to go down to the world, he passed through the Madyaas mountain in Panay. So my rough estimate of where uh, Madyaas is. But we see a correlation between uh, the path of Typhoon Yolanda. So how these descriptions of where these Diwatas pass through, okay, they correspond to the path of uh, some of the strongest typhoons that have uh, passed through the area in recent memory. So 2013, 1912, 1897. And this is the location of the other identifiable uh, sacred spaces for uh, deities like Laon and Linok, who will you will see again later on. So Linok uh, is a uh, name for Ediwata, which is quite central to the origin narratives of the Visayans. So there are some variations in these origin narratives, but what they have in common are some of the names like Captain, Kapatag, uh, Linok, or uh, as written by Fray San Agustin, an Augustinian Linok, in 1698, who was the god of earthquakes, who had married the first man and woman. So we will learn more about uh, the significance of this man and woman story, Sikalak and Sikabai, um, because it has bearing on the landing in Kumunhun. So I mentioned the giant movement. So we can surmise that this movement of a, an apparent giant from Limasawa to Panahon to Humonhon uh, is linked to earthquakes because in the 1950s, uh, in this project called the Historical Data Papers, they also noted this name, Eno, Eno, Inuk, which are uh, similar to Lino or Lino, Lino. So there are uh, variations again in these labels. But this giant was believed by the old folks in the 1950s as uh, the reason for the shaking of the ground. So, but we see again this link between giants in the 20th century and the Watas in the Spanish contact. So the question is, was Makapatag a war god? So in an earlier uh, presentation, so in the countdown to 500 uh, lecture series, so I argue that in terms of the names of the Diwatas and their associated abodes like Kumonhon, okay, we can see uh, uh, there's a match up. So Makanduk is unnamed as to where he was located or uh, where he was based, but there's a similar word, Makanduk, the name of the giant I mentioned earlier, which is associated also with Kumonhon. Uh, especially the Makanduk version, which is the name given to that giant in Suluan today. Uh, and uh, the Makapatag deity of Humunhon in Alsina and Chirino's accounts. So we see that they are both linked to Humunhon. And more than that, Makanduk, the war god mentioned by uh, Luarca, is basically a uh, synonym of Makandog. So these two words, I argue, are uh, this. So they mean basically to terrify. So someone that is so terrifying that uh, people tremble in fear. So we can see this in the early Visayan dictionary by Sanchez, where we see this uh, word linked to a frightening enemy, but we also see how they were beginning to uh, link this to evangelization. Pero it was linked to war, to raids, so to very fearsome people. And in today's summer dialect, so anduk, maka, makanduk, and makandog, andog, they again has have something to do with trembling in fear. So in Tagalog, kilabot, which is the word they used to describe the waray waray gang in the 1990s and early 2000s. And perhaps also to the raiders uh, on China, which are believed to have come from the Visayas. You know, they just heard the word pishoyi, okay, they would run away and 
tremble and run away in uh, fear. So makandog, as uh, mentioned earlier, uh, makapatag, makandog, okay, they are um, indicators of an enabler. So someone that causes fear or causes things to be flattened or to be equalized. So another interesting uh, information is how humonhon is linked to uh, or near some of the most feared feared and respected uh, clans or kaanak in the uh, early Spanish or the Spanish contact. So we have this description by uh, Father Alcina again, how the Pintados or this is Luarcas, the Pintados are a courageous and warlike race. So they have continued wage war on both land and sea. So this is a general uh, description, but Alcina provides more specific uh, locations. So both Samar, the west coast of Samar Island and Ibabao, so the northern and eastern coast were considered as brave and feared in their antiquity. So the Ibabao Kuno in particular were regarded as the most feared by the Visayans in ancient times. So apparently within the Visayas were themselves feared. So ancient Boholanos were, according to Alcina, the bravest and most courageous in these Visayan islands. So there's also a passage in San, Mateo Sanchez's and other Jesuits' uh, early dictionary. So uh, a word, Hinsug, which is today Hinsug, which means uh, healthy or magnani fitness connotation, but at that time had links to bravery, courage, and fearsomeness. So all the relatives are brave. So he emphasized or pinpointed Baklayon, uh, Dawis, Sikiho, Sikior, Panaon, uh, and uh, these areas as brave or fearsome mga mga clans. So we notice how these areas, Samar, Ibabao, uh, Bohol, and the nearby islands, okay, they are somehow uh, close to Kumunhon. So what would have been the significance of this island to uh, these feared clans or raiding clans? So there are other links, uh, Datu Sumanga, the epic of Bohol uh, about uh, raids conducted to win over Bugbunghu Masanun. It also mentioned a raid in China. So this highlights how these raids were, raids were quite wide ranging. And Alcina also provides the uh, specific or favorite nga sites to raid by the people of Ibabao. So Albay, uh, as far as Kasiguran in Luzon and islands of Patanduanes and also in Manila. So he, Alcina mentions how they even captured principales or mga datus and a lot of these families uh, in his time, 1668, were still living in places like Beri, Bobon in northern Samar, and as far south as Borongan in eastern Samar. So other uh, links between these groups, so Pigafetta mentions how the uh, ruler of Masawa was a brother of Siawi, who was the ruler of Butuan Kalaghat. And in the Spanish contact, so in before, Ligaspi's arrival, Tewaray Tupong was uh, the leader, but they were dispersed because of a Ternatan Portuguese raid. So another link between islands are those of Bangkau and the elites of Bohol. And uh, we will see how this was linked in the Tambot, Tamblot and Bangkau uprisings, which began at the same time. So it's apparently because the leaders who led these revolts were relatives. So perhaps kinship ties that went back to pre-colonial times. So other groups identified include the Arayas, the Iligines. So these were groups that were associated again with uh, raiding. But what is the role of Humunhon for these raiding groups? So we will see in uh, looking at the uh, data regarding burial sites. So in uh, 1590, 50, 1859, 1860, Fedor Yagor had visited these areas and he noted how um, an island now called Ando, but Andog at the time apparently, so again, Maka Andog, uh, a probable connection, 
and the island of Omonhon had been burial places for the warriors of these people in pre-colonial times. And there were also links to uh, slave sacrifice uh, in these uh, burial rituals. So their heroes, meaning the Daragangan warriors of old, were usually buried in these uh, uh, cliffs or caverns. So usually <coughs> caves that are found in islets. And the most prominent perhaps is that of uh, Hong Hon. But in contemporary folklore, we will also see that uh, Homon Hon is linked to these spirits that are also connected with epidemic disease or slave raiding and uh, their souls being held captive in, in Homon Hon. So very uh, perhaps difficult to disentangle what is the historicity of these uh, narratives, but we can uh, perhaps present some possibilities. So one of which being epidemic disease was uh, believed to have been caused in the early Spanish period by angered Diwatas who were uh, resisting the encroachment of the Jesuit missionaries. So I have here four pins uh, and I'll uh, show what the link with Homonhon is among these narratives. So in uh, Poro Island in Yacamotes, okay, they have this uh, belief about a cave, uh, a popular tourist spot in that island uh, where one uh, entrance or one part passage leads to uh, the Jesuits who were believed to be protectors from disease. So this is again from the historical data papers. And uh, we can link this to the uh, historical fact of how the Jesuits became renowned for their healing of smallpox uh, in the 1590s, so around 1596 and 1597. And that was probably why a lot of the Visayans had converted because they saw baptism as a way of uh, healing from this very deadly disease at that time. So the other passage, according to this account uh, presented by Mamlinda Alburu in an earlier uh, webinar is that evil people from Omonhon were spreading cholera and smallpox so that their uh, souls could be brought to Homonhon as slaves. So again, very strange nga folktale, pero what is the uh, significance of this in relation to the landing of the expedition? So, or in the role of Homonhon in pre-colonial times. So another account, this time from Akabalian, which is similar that the souls were brought to Homonhon to become slaves and those who died of cholera, they were not actually dead. So they were just replaced with this, uh, a stock of uh, banana perhaps, and uh, the banana tree. Uh, but what's interesting about this story from Kabalian in Southern Leyte is that uh, the spirit from Omonhon is called Apoy, which is basically an ancestor or Apu in uh, the Luzon languages. So in Cagayan de Oro, uh, Father Demetrio, uh, in a compilation of folklore, had also uh, found this uh, folk tale about Homonhon as the island where Encantos had brought their victims of cholera and chickenpox. So we see how disease was associated with spirits coming from Homonhon who wanted to take away souls and be, uh, be, make them slaves in that island. So again, there's links to uh, priests of how they were able to overpower these encantos and they were the only hope in fighting against these evil spirits. So among the Mamanwas, kay, the Humonhon is a word for a class of notoriously evil messengers of Satan so that induce a shaman to kill. So they uh, don't put uh, responsibility on the shaman for the killing because he had only been made to do so by this evil spirit called Homonhon. So we can liken this or compare this to other cultures in the Philippines where they had uh, war spirits uh, like Hipags among the Ifugao or uh, the Busao among the Baganis of uh, the Mandayas and Bagobos. So they were war spirits that were invoked to give them courage and valor. 
So this is now another possibility of why homonhon was significant. And among the Manobos, there's also a link uh, between the Gatnen spirit beings and uh, spirits from homonhon and uh, Panlaon volcano. So again, these two, uh, ang Makapatag and Malaon, they were interchangeable names, but they were ritually approached, these Tagatnen spirits, when uh, there was an epidemic. Uh, so they invoked them for healing. And another link to Humunhon in, uh, among the Agusan Manobos was this word, the Nailan, Dumahilan, the Nadilan, which according to Dr. Ben Consejo, who came upon these terms, were uh, synonymous to Magellan. So there's a link in among the Abugusan Manobo between Magellan and uh, an encounter between foreign and uh, native. So here I have uh, the etymology of Laon. So it meant something old and old harvest. So she was a goddess uh, invoked for uh, harvest. So he, she was also linked to volcanic eruptions. So the context are slave sacrifice. So how these burial areas like Komonhon had uh, required slaves to be killed in order for their chiefs to be accompanied by uh, minders in the afterlife. But another possibility is that Komonhon had also been a pilgrimage site for raiders. So these fleets might have passed through this island and performed rituals in order to uh, receive ferocity or isub. Because as we saw from those uh, war spirits in other cultures, nearby cultures, kay, uh, the Visayans had also believed that by invoking their ancestors, uh, most of which might have been buried in Homonhon and nearby uh, islets or sacred islets, kay, they might receive courage or ISO before they conducted these wide-ranging raids. So two words of which included Pagdaga and Pagdasi. So thus, why was Humonan enchanted? So one, it was a Diwata abode. So people were afraid to go there because uh, they believed that uh, the Diwata who inhabited the island, which is Makapatag, was easily angered by the presence of people. So this would, should be uh, linked to how uh, the Magellan expedition had spent eight days in the island without apparent uh, event. So it was an uneventful event uh, or stay. So thus there's, there might have been something in the folk mind in the early years of Spanish rule, how uh, there was a significance to the landing. And next, it was an enchanted village. So there's an account how uh, these Spaniards had seen a village, seen houses, and seen people, but upon uh, arriving at the island, they didn't see anything. So it's a bit like the Biringan story or these stories of enchanted cities that are still quite popular in many parts of the Eastern Visayas and perhaps in nearby uh, regions. But why would Humunhon come to be regarded as the source of these evil spirits? So one could be Christianization, that uh, the demonization of the indigenous spirit world by the missionaries had led to uh, this negative image of spirits coming from Mumunhon. Or as mentioned, it could have been linked to pre-colonial slave raiders. So these communities might have been victims. Uh, but it also tells us that Mumunhon was uh, somehow a spirit world destination. And we can link this to what the Jesuits have said, how their warriors upon death by stabbing or other violent death, they immediately went up to heaven to join uh, these uh, warrior diwatas. And it uh, was not only these men of courage, men of valor, but it was also the binokot, the princesses, the beautiful women who uh, also joined these warriors with the diwata of these guys. So what's the significance of this uh, image of Humonhon uh, as an enchanted island for the arrival of the expedition? So one is that 
uh, the Europeans seem to have been regarded as long lost kin of the Visayans. And two, uh, there was a narrative in the first few decades of Jesuit evangelization that uh, humonhon based diwata, so gods like Inilaon and Makapatag had caused this disease, uh, typhoons and earthquakes because they were angered by the Jesuit teachings. So there are two seemingly contradictory narratives that are going on. So one of which is that uh, the origin narratives of the Visayans, so especially this area of Panay, uh, which uh, the group of which was called the Tingyanis, the mountaineers in Luarca's account. So he said that those who fled out through the door uh, are the Spaniards and they had no news of us until they beheld us return through the sea. So there is a narrative about the Spaniards being long lost kinsmen of these uh, Visayans in the uplands of Panay, uh, which is linkable to Alcina's account that uh, these uh, ships of Magellan had been seen as somehow a significant event that they had landed in uh, Humonhon in the beginning of the Spanish uh, occupation or Spanish contact. So we can link this to these origin narratives, how Captain uh, had been regarded as a very significant deity in the uh, birth or the emergence of the first man and woman. So he had been the one to plant the uh, bamboo reed that had uh, been the uh, container for Sikalak and Sikabai. And in the, the, in the dispersal narrative of the uh, dispersal narrative of the Tingyanes and many parts of the Visayas, okay, we see how the chiefs uh, were, so this is based on a widespread story that the social classes had been originally part of the same family, but the children had been dispersed by an angry father primordial father, apparently because these children were lazy. So he planned to uh, get rid of these children. And the uh, chiefs who hid in the inner rooms of the house became, oh, the children who came hid in the inner rooms of the house became the chiefs. So those who hid in the outer rooms became the timawa. And those who uh, hid within the wall, the ding 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 became the slaves. So those who hid in the kitchen, especially the fireplace, became the uh, negritos. And the Spaniards, so this is the uh, end of that account. So they were the ones who went out the door and they had no news of these people until they saw them return to the sea. So it's possible that that return had uh, been the, re the landing in Omonhon and that became part of the narrative among these Visayan islands, especially uh, how Kapatag, Kaptan, there was a correlation how Tumunhon uh, had been linked to this deity that had a role to play in the origin story of the human race. So there's even a version from Tucano, which is updated now. It's no longer just the Spaniards, but it also included the Americans. So one of the three primordial ancestors of the Ati, the uh, Spaniard or the Europeans and the uh, Sulud. So which is, since this is from the Sulud Society book of uh, Hokano. So Sit went far, far away and was not heard from until his children returned. So it's very similar to how Luarca recorded that the Spaniards were these long lost kin who lived who they saw return through the sea. So again, the landing in Humonhon is possibly the beginning of that. So what are the possibilities? So there might have been a link between Luarca's account and Alcina's uh, discovered oral tradition. So even, even though he didn't believe in the landing in Humonhon, but the people insisted that that indeed happened. These ships uh, went to Humonhon in the past. And it's possible that uh, in the early years, this became part of that origin narratives. And these were our long lost uh, relatives who had returned first to Munhon, and then they uh, began to settle in other parts of the Visayas, especially with 
uh, the Jesuit evangelization. So there's uh, therefore a possible link between these oral traditions in terms of the Diwata names and their origin stories. So if uh, Bob had talked about uh, Chirino, oh, Chirino uh, mythologizing uh, Enrique as the first Balikbayan, so this is the six, late 16th, early 17th century version. So the Spaniards as the Balikbayans, as uh, Kidlat Tahimik had recently titled his uh, uh, long in production your film, Balikbayan number one. So there was subsequent uh, hospitality in these areas. So in fact, uh, Abuyo, which is Leyte, Tandaya, which is Samar, and Masawa became the islands first known as Las Pilipinas. And they were called as such because uh, the Villalobos expedition was uh, recognizing the support they gave to the early expedition. So the question is, might that have something to do with the earlier visit of uh, the Magellan expedition on Homonon. But as mentioned, my counter narrative, so there was a belief that the early catastrophes and uh, epidemics, so even before COVID, na ng smallpox epidemic, but at the time it was believed to have been caused by Makapatag and upon the influence of Inilaon. So again, Kapatag is either another name for Laon or as a son of Laon. And another, other events included the typhoon of 1601 and the earthquake of 1608. So we see how this seemed to have led to uh, a rupture between the relationship of the Visayans with their ancient uh, deities, so especially their greatest deities. So this description appears to suggest that uh, there was an ongoing relationship or uh, exchange. So they offered tuba to their god, but they were no longer being responded to. So he no longer loved them, but and so kills them by sending uh, disease. So this was their explanation in the 1580s. And as mentioned, uh, in the Chirino account and in the Alcina account, a similar phenomenon. So disease as caused by the anger diwata because they were against the teachings of the uh, Jesuits. And magskam kuno na ang teaching sa Jesuit and it was a means for the Spanish king to extend his kingdom. So there was this vengeance aspect that was at play, a very important to Visayan cultures that if you incurred an injury, you must uh, punish the oppressed, uh, the uh, the one at fault. And in this case, it was the Visayans who were being punished by their Diwata for accepting uh, Jesuit teachings and colonization. So this return narrative would be repeated in the subsequent uh, periods. So there's always this uh, attempt to return to their old traditions. And these narratives continue to survive in the accounts of uh, the uh, Suluanons. So the first people who were in, uh, who met or and welcomed the Magellan expedition. So they believed that their survival from Yolanda was brought about by the strength and the uh, isog imparted to them by their ancestor Maka, Makandog. And there's a mention of uh, the resistance of Makandog against the colonizers, but there's no more mention of them as, of these invaders as their kin. So in conclusion, uh, the Magellan Elcano expeditions landing in Omonon Island allowed for much needed rest and recovery after a treacherous Trans-Pacific voyage. So Omonon was uninhabited since it was locally regarded as a sacred island and pilgrimage site that served as the abode of their greatest diwata or diwatas and as an apparent burial site or spirit abode for departed warriors and ancestors. So folkloric evidence from the first 150 years of uh, Span Spanish rule uh, suggests that the expedition's transit uh, and landing in Homonhon was widely remembered in Visayan folk memory despite doubt and belief from early 
disbelief from early chroniclers such as Alcina. So uh, the expedition's uneventful landing in the sacred island of Kumunhon and the island, Suluan Islanders' warm welcome appeared to be linked to the two narratives I mentioned, uh, the Spaniards as returning relatives and as uh, the catastrophes, disease epidemics of the early Spanish period as caused by angered homonhon based Tiwatas. So these contradictory or changing narratives of return and retribution would shape subsequent responses to colonial rule. So this included conversion uh, with the help of the Jesuits, uh, resistance and attempts to return to their old way of life. But we also see that uh, this transformed, uh, this led to a uh, synthesis of these two belief systems in order to accommodate Christianity and Western culture, as well as older customs and values, so such as Isum, uh, which is very important to the Visayans in order to survive in a very hazard prone environment. So damo, this ends my presentation. Uh, damo nga salamat. Yung mo pa yung adlaw. Hi, yung tala. Thank you very much, Dr. Borinaga. That was quite a fascinating lecture. Uh, it's uh, really interesting to learn about the belief systems of our early uh, ancestors in the Visayas, especially in the way they viewed Homonhon Island, uh, the significance they gave to the island, which changed over time. And also quite fascinating was the idea of how they viewed the Europeans as returning relatives. And in the same manner, their attitude towards these uh, returning relatives also changed over time in the idea of trying to reclaim their um, uh, culture uh, and at the same time moving on towards an idea of accommodation. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Barinaga, for that uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, again, we would like to remind everyone that questions for our speakers um, can be typed in the chat box or in the Q&A section of Zoom or in the comments section of Facebook. Your questions will be answered by our speakers at the last part of this event. So from Homonhon, we move to another island and that is Palawan, as our next speaker will talk about interactions that occurred during the initial contact of the natives of Palawan with the members of the Magellan Elcano expedition back in 1521. Our third speaker, Professor Michael Angelo A. Doblado, is currently the director of the Palawan Study Center of the Palawan State University. He is an active member of the board of directors of the Natural Historical Foundation of Palawan, which manages the Palawan Museum. He has presented papers in national and international historical conferences organized by the Philippine Historical Association. And his research interests include local town histories, ethno histories, and social histories of Palawan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my, my paper for today, this afternoon, is entitled 1521 Palawan, Contact and Encounters in the Gapetas Promised Land. So the purpose of uh, this paper is to first identify the approximate uh, angle ridge and landing areas of the Magellan and Khan voyage in the province of Palawan, and then show the different courses of action taken by the Spaniards in each of these anchorage and landing areas. And in doing that, uh, we would attempt to present uh, the contacts and encounters that happened between the Spanish crew and the early people of Palawan. And this is actually an attempt to show glimpses of the characteristics and traits of these early Palawan people based on the manners and ways they have interacted with the Spanish crew. Uh, the methodology employed in this study is called triangulation in historical site identification. The historical narratives were based on the notes of Antonio Capeta and the other two crew members. Also essential were the old maps of Palawan, existing ethnographies of indigenous people of Palawan and other related studies. So the first anchorage happened in the municipality of Abordan. This is followed by the first landing, which happened in Brooks Point. 
second landing is in Malabang, and the third landing is in Batarasa. All of these uh, municipalities or towns are located at the southern part of the mainland province of Palawan. So in the important historical marker, uh, this was actually based in uh, near the shore of Parangay uh, Marikit in San Juan in Aborland. It represents uh, the Magellan and Canon voyage or expedition in Palawan uh, for the entire uh, province of Palawan. So you can see here in 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 the bas relief or the sculpture the interaction happening uh, between uh, Spaniards and the local people of Palawan. So Aborna was the area of the first attempt to land. The crew were able to row near the shore but were driven away by spear through throwing people. Abordan today is dominated or populated mostly by the Tagbanawa. So the old Abordan area was the ancestral domain of the Tagbanawa. So it actually spans the entire mini section or middle area of the island. That is from east to west coast. So there is a theory. My, my theory here is that. Um, it was the ancestors of the Dagbanwa who were the ones who drove away the Spaniards. So they only they were only able to, to cast anchor, attempted a first landing here, but they were driven away. The first landing happened in Brooks Point. So this is the marker for Brooks Point. Uh, and it is in Bigafetta's uh, chronicle. He drew the map of uh, of Palawan and indicated it there uh, Porto Porte de Tegosao or the Porto de Tegosao. So the marker here was installed in Barangay Barong Barong in Sitio Tegosao beside the river Tegosao. So Brooks Point, Rizal, Española, Quezon were all um, part of the ancestral domain of the Palawan. So this is the area of the first landing. Uh, this is also the place where uh, the crew were already starving. They were able to eat. Not only that, they were able to trade and then restock provisions needed for their ship. And what is interesting here is there's actually two landings that, take, uh, that took place in, in Brooks Point. So the first landing is probably with the first encounter, the first landing, the first encounter were probably with the Palawan. It was also mentioned there that uh, Joel Campos was the, the sailor who volunteered to come ashore. And he said, uh, it's, uh, it's okay for me to be captured or killed because I'm not a navigator. So if anything happened to me, it would not be a loss to the entire crew or to the entire ship. So surprisingly, uh, they were welcomed, or John Campos, the one who volunteered to come ashore, was welcomed, was fed, and entertained, and he was able to trade. You know? And word of the, of, of, of the foreigners trading with the local uh, people spread all over the, the place. Uh, and what happened here is another group coming from, from a nearby area invited the Spanish crew to transfer to their area and also to trade with them. So they were invited to sail to another area to trade. The most interesting part here is uh, when, when they, they were trading, trading uh, an, an emissary, emissary of the governor of Palawan, uh, a Portuguese-speaking native who is also Christianized, went, uh, went to talk with the Spanish crew and then asked for their passport and their flag. Now, now here we have the picture of uh, 
the third landing. This is actually Balabac Waters. So Balabac was the landmark or the landmark or the reference point that the Spaniards used when they sailed to Borneo, and also a boundary return trip to Palawan. It was mentioned in, in the document in sources as Bibalon and Biloba in other sources. And this is also the place where the ships ran aground. And they had to repair uh, the ship because it already had holes and it was leaking. Now, the third landing happened in Batarasa, in the Cape of Palawan. The title or the name of the marker is here is Dulo ng Palawan or Cape of Palawan. So this, so this is the area where they rested and repaired their ships after coming off from the waters of Balabac. Buliduyan, yung binakadunong parangay sa Batarasa, meant resting place. It is already indicated in the uh, old maps of Palawan. Buliduyan means uh, a place where the ships rest or stop in order to uh, restock wood or water or to trade before going on to other points. So at this place, Pigafetta and the other crew members explored the area and collected the supplies. It was specifically mentioned by Pigafetta as the end or the island. Another interesting uh, event here was Tuan Mahmoud, who also claimed he, is, uh, he was the uh, governor of Palawan, was taken hostage together with his son and brother upon the return from Borneo. So I'm about to show um, a table which will illustrate the place or the anchorage in that area, the Spanish initiated courses of action, the reaction of the local people, and the characteristic of the trade is displayed by the people of the Palawan. So first we have a Borland. The course of action taken by the Spaniards were exploring this is called the So here they attempted to land. But the Tagbalwa or the ancestors of the Tagbalwa drove the Spaniards away from the shore. The characteristic for trade is displayed by the Tagbalwa or the ancestors of the Tagbalwa were regularly encouraged. It is my theory that the Tagbalwa was um, experienced what we call mistaken identity. Uh, they have mistaken the Spanish landing crew uh, with that of a Moro reigning party. So their action to drive away the Spaniards can be considered an act of the defense of their own land, their community, and their family. The Spaniards, on the other hand, were desperate and worried. So they experienced um, uh, treachery uh, in, in the Visayas. No? So they were already wary. They were already cautious. And they did not force the issue. So they returned to their ships. With regards to Brooks Point, the courses of action taken, uh, there were several courses of action taken by the by the Spaniards. So the first year was baiting, a form of sacrifice. So they sacrificed one of their crew members, whose name is John Campos, in order to, to test if they would be welcome in the community. So as it happened, John Campos was welcomed and invited to the center of the hamlet. Here, the soldier was fed and, 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 and entertained. And he also initiated the trade. So at this point, we can say that the characteristic, characteristic um, the display by the people were being kind, humane, hospitable, trusting, and honest. They were also industrious because upon hearing of 
of the need for food, what was available back then was uh, rice or palay, um, unhusked rice. The native or the inhabitants pounded rice all night because that was the, the food that was needed. No? That was the only uh, food that they can trade with the Spaniards. Spaniards uh, displayed what we call desperation. They were desperate and they were desperate because they were starving. Another course of action taken by the uh, by the Spaniards Spaniards were negotiating and diplomacy. So they traded and then sailed to a nearby area and observed official protocols. So they were boarded by an emissary of the local chief. The name, the name of the emissary or representative was a champ. He reported to be speaking in Christianized native. The, the traits was, that, was, uh, the the traits that the were displayed here was being cosmopolitan. Kasi alam na nila yung ways of the world. So they have knowledge of protocols. Bus camp asked for the passport and the flag of the Spanish crew. And he said that he represents the governor of Palawan. So this indicates that there was already a political structure. And, and it hints of a connection with the Sultanate of Borneo. So, Carvajal made a blood compact with the local chieftain. And, and at this space, uh, the, the first uh, documentation of cockfighting or sabong uh, happened. So, part of the trade center, it shows the Palawan part of the trade center that it is going on between Malaysia, Borneo, Island of Palawan, Sulu, and Mindanao. Palawan is very important for traders because they are sources or they were sources of products and they were also sources of slaves. So there were uh, instances where local population or local people were raided or local communities were raided in order to collect people to be sold to the trade, to the slave trade uh, economy happening at that time. And the, the next course of action taken by the Spaniard, Spaniards were commanded or the Pirates of Pamimirata. By July, they set sail for Borneo. They invited actually Bastiam to guide them when they sailed to Borneo. But Bastiam was a no-show. So upon um, uh, casting off, uh, upon sailing, so they left yung, they left the port of Tagusau, and they were going to the general direction of Borneo. Uh, they came across a boat having three, uh, uh, three passengers, or three crew members, and they hijacked this, uh, this boat and ordered the three passengers to guide them to Borneo. Okay, uh, there, uh, there was, was nothing, nothing uh, eventful that happened in, in, in Malabak. The Spanish ships ran and drowned along Malabak waters. waters. So, so after repairing their ships, they, they went, went to, to Bulimian and Batarasa to, to, to anchor there. there. So, they, they stayed there for, for at least uh, one, one month in order to be stuck. And then, and then they left at the Cape of Palawan, so in Dulu ng Palawan, which is Bululuyan, they will go back to Mindanao. So when they were leaving uh, the Cape of Palawan, or Bululuyan Magarasa, they chanced upon a boat. And then they held the boat, or the passengers of the boat, hostage. So on board was Tuan Mahmud, who also uh, declared himself the governor of Palawan. Together with Tuan, who was his son and his brother, they were, they were held hostage for ransom. So Tuan Mahmud acted in a civil manner and stated that he was the governor of Palawan. Uh, he displayed pride and being honest. He gave the Spaniards all that, that they asked for, 400 measures of rice, 20 pigs, 20 goats, 20 uh, 450, 450 chickens, chickens and, and much, much more. more. So, 
yung hostage taking, the hostage taking um, evolved into uh, an, inter- an interaction of goodwill and friendship. Because Tuan Mahamud received all their demands and were given additional supplies. So Tuan Mahamud, his son and his brother parted with the Spaniards as friends. Okay, so to summarize, the course of action taken by the uh, by the Spaniards in Palawan involves several uh, methods. You have exploration and discovery, baiting or sacrificing a crew member, negotiating and diplomacy, and several acts of commandering or what we call piracy. Um, even though these were the courses of action taken by the, the Spaniards in their contacts and encounters with the local people of Palawan 500 years ago, the people of Palawan displayed positive characteristics. They displayed bravery and courage when they drove away the Spaniards, mistaking them for a moral raiding party. They displayed uh, humanity, humane, humaneness, pagiging matatao. They displayed uh, their trusting nature. They even disclosed uh, that they were under the Sultan of Borneo, but they were a uh, wali of the Sultan and the Moros because the Moros were preventing them, prohibiting them from eating pork or taking or raising pork or pigs in, in, in their areas. They told that to Joam Campos, the soldier who sacrificed himself, who volunteered to come ashore. They were also very industrious. So when Joam Campos said that we needed food, we needed rice, they pounded rice all day in order to, to satisfy the demands or the needs of the two ships. They also displayed a level of cosmopolitanism or pagiging medyo o moderno, o moderno at that time, no? Because they know yung tinatawag nating official protocols. They, even the governor of Palawan had an emissary, and this emissary knows how to speak Portuguese. So meaning, Palawan is not really at the fringe. Hindi siya nasa dulo ng nangyayari sa Southeast Asia at that time. Palawan is part, or maybe part of the center. Uh, what was mentioned here was the, the trade between Malaysia, Borneo, Brunei, Palawan, uh, you have Sulu, Tawi-Tawi, and Mindanao area. So very strategic ang Palawan because it's the source of raw materials, also the source of, of people to be sold in the slave trade. What else? Nobility and being proud. Tuan Mahmud was actually insulted when uh, these were uh, the articles that were demanded as price for his ransom. Hindi lang niya binayaran or, or prinoduce yung hinihingi ng mga Kastila, dinagdagan niya pa. Kasi nga, nainsulto siya na yun lang ang hiningi ng mga uh, Kastila, samantalang siya ay isang mataas na, na official o siya ay pinuno o governor ng Palawan. And then syempre, being friendly. Um, in, in their interactions, uh, it is repeatedly uh, shown that Aside from the Aborlan incident, the early Filipino people or the early Palawenyo inhabitants 500 years ago were very hospitable and friendly. So in, in, in context, two to three years ago, this was not actually a common historical knowledge in Palawan. So the discovery that Palawan is part of the, uh, of the circumnavigation, and we have here four historical markers already installed in Aborlan, in Brooks Point, in, in Batarasa, in Balabac, changes the prehistoric narrative of Palawan. And it also showed to the country the positive traits of our early ancestors. And we can be proud of that, especially the Palawanians. So this, this is our, Our contribution, contribution to, to Philippine, Philippine history, history in the context, context of, of the first, first circumnavigation of the world. world. Thank, Thank you very much and abuhay tayo lahat.
Thank you very much, Professor Doblado. Um, in your lecture, you showed us that the various interactions of Picapeta and the other members of the Magellan Elcano expedition with the inhabitants of Palawan during that time, though not entirely without conflict, showcase the bravery, honesty, generosity, and kindness of our ancestors. We now understand better why Picapeta, in his writings, named Palawan as a land of promise. So, so far in this afternoon, we have already heard about the creation of the identity of Enrique de Malaca as a Cebuano and the impact of the initial contacts between our ancestors and the European explorers. Now, we will listen to how the NQC Secretariat was able to study the full itinerary of the Magellan Elcano expedition, leading to the marking of 34 historical sites. The group of speakers from the NQC Secretariat include is Juvelin Nervez, a graduate of Bachelor of Arts in History at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. She is a history researcher of the Historic Sites and Structures Documentation Center of the Historic Preservation Division of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and is a member of the National Quincentennial Committee Secretariat. The second member of the team is Mr. Joseph Alec Heradila, a graduate of Bachelor of Arts in Social Sciences with a major in History from the University of the Philippines, Baguio. He is a history researcher with the Local Historical Committee's Network of the Historic Sites and Education Division of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and is also a member of the National Quincentennial Committee Secretariat. And last but not the least, the third member of this group is architect Janisa Villegas, UAP, an alumna of the Technological University of the Philippines, Manila, with a bachelor's degree in architecture. She currently works as an architect too under the Heritage Preservation Division of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and is also part of the infrastructure team of the National Quincentennial Committee Secretariat. A pleasant, a pleasant afternoon, afternoon to everyone. everyone. Aside, Aside from, from commemorating the Philippine part in the first uh, successful circumnavigation of the world, the 500th anniversary of the victory of Magmagdan and other related events, or collectively known as 2021 Quincentennial Commemorations in the Philippines, or 2021 QCD, we are also celebrating this 2021, the year of our pre-colonial ancestors, which highlights our rich ancestral culture, uh, culture, civilization, belief systems, and values before the arrival of the Europeans. This presentation centralizes on the following points. First, the discussion on the initiatives of the NHGP through NQC to further promote the activities and essence of the 2021 QCP. Second, historical methods and the technical procedures that the NQC Secretariat undertaken in identifying the historical sites along the Philippine route of the Magellan and Cano expedition. We believe that these initiatives would bear fruit, especially in the future generation of Filipinos. We are hoping that nationalism and our ancient core values as manifested by our forefathers be inculcated, enriched, and transmitted in every Filipinos. We envision a Filipino society conscious of their history and culture. May these uh, produce ideas, applicable resolutions, and developments for the betterment of this nation. Any GP seats as one of the member agency of the National Queensland Kenya Committee. Among its mandate is to commemorate significant historical events and declare historically significant sites, structures and events and personages, and conduct research, produce materials in various media, and publish and disseminate historical works. Hence, the NHGP promulgated its mandates as one of the leading, leading agencies of the National Quincentennial Committee for the 2021 uh, QCP. Since 2018, the NQC has conducted almost 400 programs. Before 2020, most of our programs and projects involved physical attendance and mass participation. 
However, the implementation of these projects, of the projects for 2020 to 2022 was hampered with the immediate spread of COVID-19 around the globe. Amidst COVID-19 pandemic, the NQC found alternative ways to further promote the milestones and projects for the 2021 QCP. First, uh, is through production of educational materials in conduct of uh, online lectures. So usage of social media and other online platforms were fully maximized to involve wider range of audience and encourage a more inclusive environment. Online lectures, webinars, and other educational materials were made accessible to the public for free. The 2021 QCP official website was further redeveloped as a culmination of our major projects for the quincentennial milestones. Since 2020, we conducted 20, uh, 21 online lectures under the Countdown to 500 online lecture series, which were live streamed in Facebook pages of NQC, NHGP, Department of Education, Department of Foreign Affairs, National Commission for Culture and the Arts, Radio Television Malacanang, and the Presidential Communications Operations Office. So, uh, as you can see on the screen, here are some of the lectures we conducted. Uh, the War God of uh, Homon Hon and the Rebel of Magellan, Antonio Figafetta in the Philippine, in Philippine History and Art, Reading and Appreciating Spanish Archival Documents, and so on. The Office of, ha of uh, the House of Representatives Dep Deputy Speaker, Congresswoman Lauren Legarda, also collaborated uh, with the uh, NGP and NQC, leading to the su successful implementation of the eight episodes of the Road to 500. All of these can be accessed through the NQC online lecture portal. Uh, NQC, I, I, I'm sorry, Quincentennial Lecture Series was shown uh, through a lecture uh, delivered by Dr. Ambeto Campo in D1 Eastern Summer. Uh, educational materials were also played, uploaded online for public's usage. So these include the 500 Years Philippine uh, Spotify playlist, the NHGP produced map of the Philippine part in the first circumnavigation of the world, and other documentaries. So a separate web page for an interactive uh, map of the Philippine part in the first circumnavigation of the world can be viewed and navigated through the NQC official website. As you can see on the screen, each uh, site contains description about the events that took place in each historical site. Conceptualization and preparations to produce uh, two documentaries about the Philippine part on the first circumnavigation of the world and the 500 years of Christianity actually started last year. Uh, in October of this year, the NQC launched the documentaries Magnifying the World of Our Ancestors as witnessed and experienced by the Magellan Alcana Expedition and the Propagation of Christianity in 1521. Uh, uh, one may view the full-length documentaries at the NQC website. Yeah. To further uh, strengthen the relevance and significance of the quincentennial celebrations, we also involve uh, various age groups in our campaigns. So with Victory and Humanity in Me as the 
team, 87 children aging 7 to 12 years old participated in Batang Bagan. Not only their artistic inclination and imagination were tickled, there's gradual inculcation of the basic essence of patriotism and pakikipagkapwa in their young minds. Interestingly, entries submitted also depicted the correlation of the theme with our battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. These children acknowledge the dedication and express gratitude towards our frontliners for saving lives. Visual representations of our ancestors and pre-colonial vessels were featured in the online production of the Quincentennial Paper Doll series. This allowed any audience to access and download the crafts through the NQC official website. Then uh, we have a depiction of uh, our ancient uh, boat, such as Karakoa. So, one way to visually immortalize the life of and worldview of our ancestors is through the involvement of artistic community. Thus, the NQC organized the Quincentennial Art Competition, highlighting four themes that encapsulate uh, the Quincentennial milestones of the 2021 QCP, namely magnanimity, unity, legacy, and sovereignty. Uh, the Lapu-Lapu National Monument Design Competition was also conducted in search for the best design that will be the centerpiece for the proposed Lapu-Lapu National Shrine and Museum. So on uh, February 26, 2021, the following winners for the said competi uh, competitions were announced online. Featuring the encounter of the Magellan Elcano expedition and our ancestors 500 years ago, the Philippine Quincentennial Museum has opened to the public on April 26, 2021 at Museo Sugbo in Cebu City. This is in line with the 500th anniversary of the victory at Makta. It houses two galleries. One centralizes on historical events occurred during the Philippine part of the first circumnavigation, while the second gallery delves on the pre-colonial world view, social political system, economic structure, and flora and fauna. Aside from restrictions brought by the pandemic, so not everyone has the capacity to travel and visit the museum. So what we did, uh, uh, a website integrating a museum virtual tour was developed to have others glimpse of the museum. So we also provided uh, free access to the materials uploaded in the website uh, intended for educational purposes. The virtual tour of the Philippine Quincentennial Museum. So we encourage everyone uh, 
to visit the National Quincentennial official website where you can uh, see or view many educa educational materials, specifically for the commemoration of uh, the, the quincentennial events in the Philippines, uh, the celebration of the 500th anniversary of the victory at Mactan, and other related events. So one of the major projects of uh, the NQC is marking the 34 sites of the Philippine route of the Magellan and Cano expedition. So the, the determination and identification of these sites will be further discussed by uh, Joseph Alec Radilla and architect Janisa Villegas. So turnover ceremony and veiling of Quincentennial uh, memorial markers started in Giwan Eastern Summer on March 16, 2021. So on April 27, the Filipino people witnessed the simultaneous conduct of activities and programs in commemoration of the 500th anniversary of the victory at Mactan. A nationwide simultaneous flag raising ceremony and replaying rights to various monuments of our heroes and great men and women in different localities were held. So in uh, the Liberty Shrine, the commemorative program was graced by the Office of the President, uh, Executive Secretary Salvador Medialdea. So our military men paid honorary parade to Lapu-Lapu. Historical markers for Mactan, Lapu-Lapu, uh, and Ferdinand Magellan were unveiled during the event. So various historic sites and landmarks across the country uh, were also lighted in blue. So that's uh, Museo Emilio Aguinaldo in Cavite, Presidential Car Museum in Quezon City, and uh, a part of Museo Cerizal in Dapitan. So in uh, Miss Universe 2018, Catriona Gray, uh, hosted the Quincentennial Evening Show in Liberty Shrine. Those are uh, glimpses of the events during that uh, night on April 27. So aside from that, actually the NHCP and the NQC uh, also took the opportunity to update the historical marker of Lapu-Lapu so what you can see on the screen is the 1951 Lapu-Lapu marker. And the next one is the updated version of the Lapu-Lapu marker. So bearing uh, uh, more comprehensive content about Lapu-Lapu and the uh, historic, uh, historic victory of our ancestors in Mactan against uh, against the Magellan Elcano expedition. So the successful implementation of the 2021 QCP would not be possible without the utmost support and active participation of various institutions, organizations, local and national government units, most especially the member agencies of the NQC, namely the Office of the Executive Secretary of the Republic, Secretary of the President of the Philippines, NHCP, Department of the Interior and Local Government, Department of National Defense, Department of Foreign Affairs, the, uh, Department of Education, Presidential Communications, Operations Office, uh, National Commission for Culture and the Arts, Office of the Advisor for Presidential Advisor for the Visayas or OPAV, Department of Public Works and Highways, Department of Tourism, and the Department of Bad, uh, Budget Management. We are very grateful for integrating the 2021 Quincentennial Commemorations in the Philippines in the plans and programs of uh, various in institutions and organizations. So as we can see, in uh, 
in social media and other online platforms, activities such as webinars, exhibit, cultural shows, artwork, competitions, were conducted to further uh, uplift and celebrate the life of, an, of our ancestors and the deeds of our heroes. Again, we are truly honored by the efforts initiated uh, by various institutions in local and national government agencies. So still part of the promotions of the 2021 QCP, the NQC produced marketing collaterals and souvenirs such as the quincentennial themed calendars, The first one uh, highlight, highlighted uh, some of uh, 12 of the 34 uh, historical sites uh, along the Philippine route of the, of the Magellan Lican expedition. Another uh, quincentennial team uh, calendar featuring uh, artworks about uh, the, about the quincentennial celebrations in the Philippines, the 500th anniversary of Christianity in the Philippines. We also produced face masks, lapu-lapu monuments, quincentennial memorial markers, jacket, tote bags, and NQC flaglets, polo shirts, and t-shirts, lanyards, brochure, and umbrellas. To end this part of uh, our presentation or the presentation of the National Quincentennial Committee Secretariat members, uh, this is the vision of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, a Filipino society with citizens informed of their history who love their country and are proud of their cultural heritage. So while aiming to foster a Filipino centric point of our history through reclaiming the world of our ancestors, may these initiatives, programs, and projects of the NQC and NHGP contact, uh, conceptualize and implemented bring a uh, long lasting effect to, the, to this generation. Let us always remember that our ancestors have had flourishing civilization, unique worldview, and belief systems prior to the arrival of the Europeans. May the values, kindness, bravery, and sacrifices of our forefathers not be wasted and serve as our guiding light for the better future of our nation, especially now that we are facing this pandemic. Let uh, the complexity complexities and greatness of our pre-colonial ancestors be inculcated in the hearts of every Filipino. Thank you very much. Um, as previously discussed by Ms. Uh, Jubilee Nierbes, the National Quincentennial Committee Secretariat endeavored to locate and mark 34 sites of the Philippine itinerary of the Magellan Elcana expedition as part of the 2021 quincentennial commemorations in the Philippines. The primary task of locating these 34 sites fell onto the laps of the researchers that are part of the secretariat, uh, namely uh, led by uh, Ian Alfonso and with uh, Jubilee Nieves and myself as uh, fellow researchers. Uh, the, research the research output for this was actually quite lengthy, uh, especially in terms of the standard research output for NHCP researchers. It, it, it came out to around 34 to 35 pages in total, excluding the proposed marker texts. Uh, this was because it contained a lot of textual analysis, as well as um, supporting documents uh, to refer to the claims 
and to the particular sites uh, uh, as uh, as we discovered. So the research methodology that we used um, to locate these 34 sites was primarily through the uh, use of textual analysis of available manuscripts and translated materials. We were fortunate enough uh, to have high res resolution scanned copies of the um, the Pigafetta manuscripts, uh, both uh, the one in Italian uh, and the one in French, uh, uh, currently with the Bibliothèque Nationale uh, in Paris, as well as the one in, Lili in the Lilly Library. Uh, apart from that, we we had a lot of help uh, from local researchers, primarily from um, Professor Mike uh, Doblado of the Palawan uh, State University, who conducted a lot of uh, on-site research um, as part of uh, their uh, researches in Palawan, and uh, as well as the work of Dr. Uh, Rolando Borinaga of the uh, UP Palo, uh, who is a preeminent historian of Eastern Visayas. Uh, it was through their local, uh, local research, uh, especially the knowledge that they had, that we weren't uh, that we did not have being based in Manila that pushed the research into uh, this kind of, uh, this level of um, uh, accuracy or um, very similitude. Um, and then we also used a lot of toponomical analysis you, uh, using the various um, place names that Pigafetta recorded uh, and compared them to the uh, existing sites uh, along the um, imagined route uh, in order to get uh, uh, the most similar or the best fit for these um, place names, as well as the general cartographic analysis where we utilized uh, some of the um, distance measurements, although this particular method was uh, utilized as a last ditch or a final method uh, in order to support some of the uh, some of the sites that we discovered. This is because uh, there is a great difficulty in um, ensuring the accuracy of the measurements made by uh, 16th century navigators due to the lack of an accurate chronometer that is used uh, to measure the proper longitude. Uh, it was only in the 17th century when the British finally developed an accurate at sea chronometer when we could actually accurately plot uh, where we are in the world. So this was made using uh, the best technology of the 16th century and um, juxtaposed upon uh, the uh, present uh, present data or present day maps uh, to, to locate or to approximate where they were and what were the places that Pigafetta was referring to. Um, we used a lot of written materials, like a lot of written materials for this particular research. Um, primarily the primary resources um, for for the Pigafetta manuscripts, we mostly used uh, ja, uh, James Alexander Robertson's um, three volume work uh, that's separate from the translation uh, that he made with Emma Blair, as well as um, the translation made by um, what's that uh, Skelton. But we also used other um, primary sources. Um, as you can see here, we have the, this one by the Anghera. Uh, and then we also had one, uh, we also used a, a report uh, made by a, Spanish, a Portuguese um, sailor uh, who captured the other half of the, of the survivors of the Battle of Mactan when they tried to cross again through the Pacific uh, from Tidor, as well as other sources, um, including maps that were available uh, in the near, uh, in, the, in our more contemporary period. But it was very challenging for us to actually do the research, uh, seeing as though the, uh, the whole route covered quite an extensive distance, uh, uh, quite an extensive scope, uh, almost two thirds of the Philippines. And because when we were doing this, or when we were primarily undertaking the work, we were geographically distant from 
most if not all of the sites. Um, being based in Manila and as NHCP researchers, um, we had to utilize modern technology for us to get a grasp of the um, the realities of the uh, location. Um, something that you can't really get by looking at two-dimensional maps. And we are fortunate enough to have um, uh, tools on, uh, at our disposal that uh, helped us immensely in creating this spatial awareness that helped us imagine, uh, reimagine uh, the route as it would have took place. It was very time consuming for us. Um, we started the research around um, mid-2019 uh, with all of the resources that we had and with all of the time that we had, it took us until mid-2020 or almost a whole year, or actually more than a year, to finalize the 34 sites. Um, even even with, the, with the wealth of materials already produced uh, on this particular topic. And uh, there was also a, a cultural limitation on our part because... Uh, from the three of us, while Ms. Nervis and I could claim some uh, Bisaya lineage, uh, we, we have to be honest that all three of us uh, came from um, Luzon, specifically around the Manila, uh, Southern Tagalog area. And uh, there were certain uh, realities of the particular places that were remarked that, we were, uh, uh, that were very difficult for us to understand or to imagine. So this is the proper, this is the actual output of the research. Uh, this was, um, this was uh, shown by Ms. Nervis earlier. And we had the first three sites. So that's, so the first one is uh, on the, uh, marking the island of Samar, uh, represented by uh, Giwan. Then the island of Suluan, the island of Homonhon. Uh, then Gibusong, which was actually marked by Pigafetta. Hinunangan or Hinunangan, and then uh, rounding Panaon Island all the way to Limasawa. Now, Limasawa is a particularly contentious site. Um, as you may know, there are uh, there are claims that uh, this was not the Masawa that uh, um, Pigafetta was referring to. But the NHCP has already decided uh, through the use of um, more in-depth research that this is the actual Masawa uh, of 1521. And then we round around the western uh, side of Leyte, up, up the islands in, uh, in between the Kanigao Channel, and to the um, Camotes Islands that form part of the um, present-day um, province of Cebu. These three islands were actually one of the best recorded uh, in terms of uh, Pigafetta's manuscript. And then we had the long stay in Mactan, uh, followed by the rapid escape after the defeat, where uh, they needed uh, the the expedition burned uh, the conception along the shore of Bohol, rounding around the island of Panilongon, which we determined through research to be uh, the island of Negros. And then uh, across the um, Zamboanga Peninsula, stopping by Kipit or Chipit, uh, and then to Mapun, or what they pre previously referred to as Cagayan de Sulu. Then going up north to Palawan. So this particular part, the Palawan part of the research, was heavily, um, was influenced heavily by the work of the Palawan Study Center, specifically by Professor uh, Michael Doblado, who is also our uh, one of our fellow speakers today, in who talked extensively about their research here. So it's best to leave that part to him. And then after Palawan, they crossed back uh, across the Sulu Sea to Sulu. And then through the um, the channel between Zamboanga City and uh, is a, the island of um, Basilan called Daghima. Then across the western shore of southern Mindanao. Uh, and then to the southern part, uh, just crossing the mouth of Sarangani Bay onto Sarangani Island. It was this particular part that necessitated a lot of secondary, uh, second second sources, uh, primary sources, but were of um, different origin. So this is where we used a lot of Portuguese and 
um, uh, eyewitness accounts. Um, because uh, this part, this particular part of the journey was uh, not well documented. So of those 34 sites, um, we managed to get um, most of them marked or uh, commitments to mark uh, with only a few um, declining the, 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 um, the honor of being marked as one of the sites. So to talk about that more extensively, I'll turn over uh, the discussion to architect uh, Janisa Villegas. Um, uh, good day to everyone who attended this conference. My name is Architect Janice Villegas. I am part of the infrastructure team of the NQC Secretariat. And today I will be talking about the conceptualization to the unveiling and turnover of the quincentennial historical markers pertaining to the marking of the Philippine part of the first navigation of the world. So essentially, I will be talking about how the marking of these sites were realized. So the outline of this discussion, first we'll talk about the conceptualization and the fabrication of the markers, then uh, the coordination with the different local government units and national government agencies, the shipment and installation of these markers, and the unveiling and turnover ceremonies. So first is the conceptualization and fabrication of the quincentennial historical markers. So let's discuss the rationale of the project. So in anticipation of the touristic, scientific, diplomatic, cultural, and historical interest to the Philippine route of the first navigation of the world, the National Quincentennial Committee or the NQC wants to take the opportunity in highlighting the Filipino voice in the narrative. So this is in response to the misconception, misconception about the quote and unquote um, discovery of the Philippines. Highlighting the foreigners and having a bad picture about the Filipino ancestors. So we did this by developing a portion of the sites along the route stalling a sculptural relief in each site depicting the episode of the expedition in it and installing a historical marker issued by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines or the NHC. So um, this is a to have a physical or tangible reminder of the history that happened within each site uh, identified to also educate the locals and tourists. So the initial proposal uh, is this flash on the screen. So for this discussion, let us just refer to this whole um, historical marker, to this whole historical marker as the marker. So the marker is composed of the pedestal uh, containing the globe signifying the first circumnavigation, the historical marker, which states a concise and factual narrative of, of what transpired in the place in relation to the first circumnavigation, and the sculptural relief or the bas relief depicting what the historical marker states. So the pedestal was designed with classical ornamentations by architect Randall O'Ryan, also part of the infrastructure team of the NQC Secretariat. So initially, the proposed material was to use bonded marble for the globe and moldings, while the pedestal will be of masonry construction in granite finish or the combination of granite and cement. However, as the project was prepared on the onset of the pandemic in 2020, a lot of adjustments were made, including the change in the materials and the method of construction. The barrelets were made as initially planned, which, is, which was casted individually, but the NHCP allowed the contractor to fabricate all the pedestals in Manila instead of constructing, constructing it in each site in respect to the health, safety, and traveling restrictions concerns uh, brought by the pandemic. So from masonry, the material was changed into reinforced fiber resin 
So the pedestal, including the bas relief, including the bas relief, and historical marker, which is made of cast iron, were fabricated and assembled into one whole piece that is just needed to be transferred and installed to the different sites. So the design of the pedestal was further developed. Uh, one is that our team presented different rendering variations of the marker and the color scheme was finalized through consultation with the NHCP architects. Another is the development, another development also is the NQC's consultation with the Philippine Space Agency to identify the actual, actual tilt of the earth that was applied to the globe atop of each of the marker. So this is the final approved design. The base, this base is to be constructed on the site. So this is where the marker is to be installed. The local government units or the LGUs were the ones responsible for the installation of the markers. And this is a sample rendering of the final approved marker installed on the sites. So the NQC was, the NQC secretariat was hands-on in the development of the mock-up of the marker prior to the mass production. The proportions, of the elements, and other details were also adjusted and developed throughout this years of inspections and consultations with the artist consultant or the contractor. Um, the battery leaves were based on the sketches of visual artist Derek Magutai, depicting the events dating from the stated from the historical markers, marker text of each site. There has also been a series of consultations between the artist and the NQC history researchers to arrive to a credible depiction based on the historical accounts. The researchers were very particular on the details that is needed to be shown. And they were also particular to correct the misconception that the Filipino ancestors are savage and uncivilized people. So the depiction in the Boxer Codex of our ancestors was very much highlighted in the values. This was during an inspection when our then history researcher, Mr. Ian Alfonso, was inspecting every clay maquette to really scrutinize the details on how the sculptor Jonas Roses translated it from the sketch. He is also the contractor for the markers. So these are the phases in the fabrication of the body leaf from the sketch to the clay maquette. And once approved, it will be casted into the final body leaf. So this body leaf is the Sarangani episode, the last marker in the list. So, um, the NHCP chairman and NTC executive director Rene Escalante was also hands-on in this project and joined the team in this inspection. Um, this is a mock-up pedestal showing the double bars below. These double bars, um, these are the reinforcements of the pedestal which will be planted in the on the base that uh, is in the sides. So this is the finished pedestal. Um, the dowels were folded underneath so that it will be uh, fit so that it will fit the crates. And this is the first batch of the pedestals to be shipped. This was in December 2020. Now we move on to the coordination. Um, the NQC identified 34 sites along the Philippine route of the first circumnavigation of the world, located in eight cities and 20 municipalities across the Palawan, Visayas, and Mindanao Islands that was already discussed a while ago by Mr. 
Alec Miradilla. So, um, the NQC requested for assistance of the national government agencies and local institutions to coordinate with their respective LGUs in organizing also the billing events. Um, somehow, a positive effect of the pandemic to this project was the use of online meetings to easily gather people from different places, as we all do now at this moment. So we conducted the first inter-LGU coordination meeting uh, regarding the project via Zoom on August 27, 2020, attended by the LGUs and local government agencies represent, representatives of uh, the for the sites. This was followed by a second meeting on September uh, 14, 2020. In these meetings, we inform, clarify, and update the stakeholders with the progress of the project pertaining to the fabrication of the markers, the things they need to prepare, etc. Um, the NQC also conducted meetings and coordinations per LGU or per area, per region. Um, this was during a meeting with the LGUs in Comotes Island in Cebu regarding the preparation for the turnover and unveiling events. So it was easy to contact people um, during this time. So um, the NQC required the following from their respective LGU government units to comply. So, they should um, provide at least 30 square meters lot with five meters buffer zone. The NQC provided the list of the locations where to install the markers. Unless the NQC has identified a specific location for the marker, like uh, a specific cap uh, capital compound or a national, national shrine, the lot shall be situated near the sea to con contextualize the sites as part of the circumnavigation route. Then, um, letter accepting the project, signed memorandum agreement, local council ordinance or resolution supporting the project, and site development plan. So the LGU's counterpart, aside from installing the marker, is to develop the site. So such as providing pavement, light landscaping, and lighting, etc. And to incentivize the cooperation of the LGUs to develop their sites, the NTUC turned this into a competition amongst those who will be able to comply. Since we understood that there will be um, there will be LGUs who wouldn't be able to fully develop their sites um, due to the budget constraints this pandemic. Um, the, the judging period actually just ended and the top three best site development, will which will receive cash prizes, will be announced during the closing ceremony of this international conference on Friday, December 17. Um, for the shipment and installation of the markers, majority of the fabricated markers were shipped by the contractor to the various sites. But the NQC also requested for the assistance of the Department of Defense or DND to ship the markers to places which have difficult access, especially in the concerns during the pandemic. One of which is in Isabela City, Basilan. The marker was delivered in April 2021 with the assistance of the Department of Defense through the Philippine Navy. So for the installation, uh, we relied on the LGU's updates due to the restrictions given the pandemic situation. So the LGU's updated us through phone calls, um, Zoom meetings, and pictures. So uh, these are some of the sites during the ongoing installation and site development. Um, uh, we closely coordinated also with the LGUs for any 
concerns that arises during the preparation installation of the markers. So um, for the site development, the LGUs had different ways to present their markers. So um, some had simple landscaping, which blended with the surroundings, like here in Kanigao marker in Kanigao Island, Matalong Bay. And also in, for the Tikobon marker in San Francisco, in Comotes Island, Sydney. While some tried to be creative, like in the site of the Panilongan marker in Dumaguete City, in which the LGU constructed concrete ship beside the lot to signify the galleons in the expedition. While there are some who conceptualized the site development based on their local culture, like in the site of the Tagima marker uh, in Isabela City, Basilan, that was inspired by Dayakan Seputangan, a head plot worn by Dayakan ethnolinguistic community natives in Basilan. While some chose to present their site simply by highlighting more of the natural environment, like the site in Balabak, Palawan, that overlooks the Sulu Sea. Now, for the unveiling and turnover ceremonies, um, the uh, NQC initially targeted to conduct the unveiling and turnover ceremonies of the Quincentennial Historical Markers on the a certain dates, the expedition landed or passed by the sites in 1521 that spanned from March 16 to October 28, 1521. So um, the, in the map that was shown here, you can see that there are the specific dates that our history researchers ascertain when the expedition actually landed or passed by the areas. However, most of the target unveiling dates were not met due to various reasons, including the traveling restrictions and lockdowns uh, due to the surge in COVID-19 cases since March to September 2021. And conflicts within the LGUs pertain to the identification of lots. So many LGUs had a hard time finding a lot due to unavailability of public lot in specific areas. Some had conflicts within private owners to secure a lot donation. Some just had a hard time to focus on the project uh, due to the COVID-19 outbreaks within their localities. To date, um, there are still five markers yet to be unveiled two markers which will be unveiled by the end of this, this December. And while the remaining others will be unveiled um, early 20, 2020. Yeah. The unveiling of the Quincentenio historical markers started at the municipality of Giwan in Eastern Samar, which with the first three markers, Samar, Suluan and Homonhon. These sites were attended by the NQC officials, members, and NHCP officials. While the summer Quincentennial historical marker that was unveiled on March 18, 2021, was actually attended by the uh, President of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, as the guest of honor. But at the but at the time there was a surge in the COVID-19 cases in Manila. So the NHCP and the NQC Secretariat decided to conduct the following unveiling events locally, meaning there were no representative from the national government to raise the events. So um, the NQC had appointed and reached out to um, different uh, agencies as the NQC representative, like for the Visayas, uh, we tapped them to um, the Office of the Presidential Assistant for the Visayas uh, with Undersecretary Anthony Gerard Gonzalez uh, being the uh, NQC representative to the provinces of Southern Leyte, 
in Cebu, and also um, the secretary of the OPAB, Secretary Michael, Michael Lloyd Dino, as the official representative for the Cebu marker. Mm. Um, the, mar the Mactan marker in Lapu Lapu City was were attended by the NHCP and NQC officials and members at, as it was conducted simultaneous to the D-Day celebration of the quincentennial anniversary of the Battle of Mactan. So, the Bohol, Panilong, and Pitik markers were also attended by NHCP officials. But the other sites in Mindanao, um, the Department of Tourism under Secretary Maya Paz, um, Balderosa Abubakar was the NQC representative for the Palawan sites. It was uh, Palawan Studies Center Director Michael Angelo Doblado, which was also part of the panel this afternoon. And for the final sites, uh, Department of Tourism Undersecretary Roberto P. Alabado III was the uh, NTC uh, representative. Thank you very much, Ms. Nervis, uh, Mr. Heredila, and Architect Villegas. Uh, the efforts exerted by the NQC in bringing these activities of the quincentennial commemorations closer to the people, especially during this time of the pandemic, is nothing short of admirable. Marking those 34 sites as part of the itinerary of the Magellan Alcano Expedition expands our knowledge of the events that happened during that time. We will always be grateful to the NQC for all of these activities. Um, at this point, we would like to remind the audience to post their questions for all of the speakers that we have today um, in the chat box of our um, Zoom, also in the Q&A section if you want to put them there. Uh, you can also type in your questions in the comment section of the Facebook um, page that you are watching. So um, uh, now that we're down to our last speaker, um, this one is uh, extremely special um, because uh, just a few days ago, the whole world witnessed the crowning of a new Miss Universe. And um, I hope I get to pronounce her name right. She is uh, Miss India's um, Harnaz Sandhu. Uh, but today, we will hear uh, how the designers of the national costume of Miss Universe 2018, our very own Catriona Gray, were able to integrate pre-colonial influences. And the speaker who will talk uh, about this is Jerwil I. Cruz, who is a graduate of Bachelor of Arts in History from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. He's currently working as a Historic Sites and uh, Development Officer too of the Historic Sites and Education Division of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. He's also a member of the Local Historical Committee's Network Secretariat and of the National Quincentennial Committee Secretariat. He's also a faculty member um, at the Department of History of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, everyone. everyone. Since, Since the Miss Universe season has just uh, passed, we Miss Universe, Universe India, India as the, the new title, title holder, holder, and our, our very, very own Miss Universe, Universe Philippines, Beatriz Luigi Gomez, having, having a top five finish with your very, very iconic uh, Bakunawa National Costume, which, which is uh, serpent like, like dragon, dragon on Philippine, Philippine mythology. It is believed to be the cause of eclipses, earthquakes, uh, rains, and, and winds. winds. So, so today, um, I will, I will be presenting the importance of the national costume of another, another Miss Universe, Universe queen, queen, which is, which is the last uh, Filipina title holder, holder of the second crown. crown. Um, um, Katrina Katrina Negri, to the, the promotion, promotion of, of the, the Philippine, Philippine, Philippine pre-Hispanic culture, culture 
and, and its uh, importance on the values of the 2021 Winston Sinyaka commemoration in the Philippines. So, uh, this presentation is actually in its journey. How, how the National, National Centennial Committee and the National, National Historical, Historical Mission of the Philippines acquired the entire ensemble of the costume and how, how it was used, used by the government to inform the people about, about, uh, about, about, about our rich uh, pre-colonial pre -colonial heritage. heritage. So, so this presentation is based on, on my, my presentation at the, the University, University of, of the Assumption that Fernando C. Pampanga last November 2019 in light of the first national conference on Lanarder Studies. So, first of all, um, disclaimer na tayo, I am not a sociologist nor an expert on fashion. I was just discussing the journey of the national costume after it was loaned to the NHGP by the owners of the costume. So we Filipinos are considered as one of the best pageant fans in the world, or perhaps the universe. So it started off with the four successive runners-up placement of Venus Ra in 2010, uh, Shams Soup Soup in 2011, Janine Togonon in 2012, and Ariella Arida in 2013. And the top 10 placements of Mary Jean Lastimosa in 2014, uh, Maxine Medina in 2016, and Rachel Peters in 2017. Then came the Miss Universe wins of Pia Wurzbach and Catriona Gray in 2015 and 2018. So the Philippines has one of the longest unbroken streaks in terms of placements in Miss Universe pageant. So until 2021, uh, we are still placing a semi-finalist with Gazini Ganados in 2019, Rabinha Mateo in the 69th edition, and lastly, in the recently concluded 70th edition, having a top five finish with Beatrice Luigi Gomez. So each year, we are very excited to see the entire wardrobe to be presented by the Miss Philippines candidates. That is why Filipinos are considered not just as the best pageant fans, but also we are also considered as, was, as the worst critic of a, of a beauty queen. So aside from the swimsuit and evening gown uh, portions of the pageant, one of the most anticipated segments of every Miss Universe competition is the national costume presentation. So through the years, the country's representatives have often kept the national costume very uh, traditional, picking either either a Maria Clara or a Filipiniana Terno. So from 2000 to 2014, many of the costumes were designed by, the, uh, by a Colombian fashion designer, Alfredo Barraza. But after the after Mary Jean Lastimosa's national costume in 2014 uh, received uh, a lot of criticisms online, so the Vinibini Pilipinas Charities Incorporated, who is the former um, holder of the Miss Universe brand in the Philippines, opened its door again to to Filipino designers, starting with Pia Wurzbach, whose Manila Carnival Queen inspired Capisterno by Albert Andrada. So following Pia, Philippine delegates Maxine Medina and Rachel Peters' national costumes took inspiration from different elements in Filipino culture. So there's the Vinta and South Sea Pearl inspired costume by Red Ayala, yung suot ni Maxine Medina, and the Sarimano inspired uh, national costume by Val Taguba. But during the 2018 Miss Universe pageant in Bangkok, Thailand, Catriona Gray and her team gave us a standout national costume called Luz Biminda. So it's inspired by the diverse culture and history of the three major island islands, so Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So as any um, 
pageant fan knows, one of the best part of the competition is actually the National Costume Show. So it is a segment uh, designed to uh, to showcase the the clothing that honors and celebrates the contestants' uh, country, home countries. So every year, outfit seems to get more complicated, um, um, opulent, lavish, or simply some are are just engineered to to go viral online para mapag-usapan. So kahit alam natin na hindi ito gaano ganoon ka comfortable suotin, talagang irarampa ito ng mga candidate. So yung iba pa nga is nagkakaroon pa ng ano ng mga malfunctions on stage lalo na pag live yung show. So in Miss Universe pageant, uh, actually the scores of the national costume does not affect the, the total results in determining the the finalist the semi finalist or or the or the winner but a beautiful and well inspired um national costume or better uh, national costume helps a candidate a lot in her journey so when a candidate wore a beautiful national costume or better yet won the national costume segment the candidate will definitely catch uh so much attention from the media or she will have an exposure which helps her to be noticed by media netizens or even by the judges. So here are the, some of the notable costumes in Miss Universe uh, pageant, in the recent Miss Universe pageants. So first, ito yung uh, Myanmar Myanmar puppet inspired national costume in Miss Universe Myanmar in 2016. And this one is medyo ito yung uh, napakalaking national costume in Miss Universe Bahamas noong 2020. And ito naman yung national costume ni Miss Universe Malaysia. And then yung elephant inspired national costume of Miss Universe Laos noong 2019. And the white elephant inspired national costume of Miss Thailand. So noong 2018 to, sila yung host country noon. And then this is a very unique uh, national costume, the transformer inspired national costume of Miss USA in 2017. And lastly, yung very iconic na um, tuk-tuk inspired costume of Miss Universe Thailand ng 2015. So the making of the national costume. So Katriona and her team have been very um, secretive about her Miss Universe wardrobe. In fact, it was only the day before the national costume competition itself, Katriona revealed the uh, overall ensemble of her costume. So, alam naman natin na very, ano, taga inilihim ng team ni Katriona yung, yung design ng costume para at surpresahin ng mga Pilipino. And I think yung iba, iba sa social media is nalaman lamang to through a stolen shot of Katriona sa backstage. So her national costume took months of conceptualization, preparation, and execution. So in various interviews days prior to her departure, she dropped hints on the theme of her costume. So this uh, uh, created a guessing game for the fans and followers of Katriona. So the one-of-a-kind costume, which is a departure from the usual Filipiniana turno, is a collaborative effort between Catriona and her team. So Jerson de Mavivas designed the boxer codex in style, styled bodysuit together with the Tiboli accessories, accessories such, as, such as the brass belt called Hilet Lemimet. So Jojo Braga is together with the assistance of Ardell Presentacion designed the knee-high boots featuring Mindanawan textile patterns. And then the Pampangan lantern reflecting the colors of the Philippine national flag was, well, was designed as well by Demavivas and executed by, Lan, by, 
Pampanga Lantern Maker Eric Kiwa and Rian Andrade incorporating the LED technology. So the floret border inspired by details of Philippine Baroque churches made of pokpok, so ito yung nasa edge ng parol, was executed by folk artist Tomas Ramirez of Betis Guagua, Pampanga. And lastly, yung nasa likod, the bottom Francisco style mural of selected vignettes from Philippine history is a collaboration of artists Kim Christine Pababair, Marina Seriola, and Reni Avila with an excerpt of the national anthem Lupang Hinirang in Baybayin text in consultation with Dante Enage. So according to Gerson, Catriona was very strict when it comes to designing the, the designing and execution of the costume. She wants the costume to be um, as authentic as possible, as, uh, as said by Gerson. That's why Catriona and her team uh, made an immersion to the cultural communities in Leyte and Lake Cebu. Actually, this is from Gerson mismo, dahil uh, during... Uh, the preparation for the Pincentennial and noong time na na-acquire ng National Historical Commission of the Philippines, yung, na loan pala ng National Historical Commission of the Philippines, yung costume sa mga owners si Catriona, um, bumibisita si Gerson sa office para bigyan kami ng background mismo kung paano niya dinesign and, in and binuo yung entire, yung costumes ni Catriona. So here are some of the teasers and IG postings of Gerson uh, de Mabibas prior in revealing to the public the entire costume. So ito yung naging process na pag-design ni Gerson sa national costume ni Kat. So the historical context of the national costume, the historical and cultural context. So the national historical of the Philippines appreciates the unique way the owners and designers inform the public the importance of the batek or the tattoo motifs in the in the Philippine history. So details of which are featured in the bodysuit designed by the Mami Vas. So which was the which was inspired by the earliest known illustration of the tattooed hangaway or Visayan warriors in the 16th century Boxer Codex of the Lily Library at, at the Indiana University. So the Boxer Codex, also called as the Manila Manuscript, is, uh, is a manuscript written and illustrated in 1590, which contains illustrations of various um, ethno-linguistic groups in the Philippines, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and Micronesia at the time of their initial contacts with the European. So it was named after Charles R. Boxer, mm -hmm. who, is who, is, who in 1947 accidentally purchased the manuscript from Lord Elchester Library at Holland House in London. So the Boxer Codex depicts the Tagalog, Visayas, Zambals, Cagayanes, and Negritos of the Philippines. So it's believed that the original owner of the box of the manuscript was Luis Perez das Marinas, son of Governor General Gomez Perez das Marinas, who was killed in 1593 by the or Chinese living in the Philippines. So Luis succeeded his father in office as Governor General of the Philippines. Since um, Spanish colonial governors were required to submit written reports on the, on the territories they governed, it is likely that the manuscript was written under the orders of the governor. So the Visayan ancestors are described in the Boxer Codex as a custom to paint their bodies with some very elegant tattoos. They do this with iron or brass rods. So the points of which are heated on fire, they have um, artisans who were adept to this. So they do this with such order, symmetry, and coordination that, uh, that they elicit admiration from those who see them. So these are done in the manner of illuminations, uh, painting all parts of the body, such as chest, um, stomach, 
legs, um, arms, shoulders, yung mga kamay, mga muscles, and, um, and among some, yung posterior part sa likod. So, the Batik motif serve as decoration for courageous warriors who emerge victorious in battles. So, um, historian Dr. Vicente Villan indicated that the Batik also serve as protection of the Dungan. So this is the an individual spirit that kept the Kaladua or your soul, soul healthy and guarded it from evil elements. So this is in Visayan, ancient Visayan society. So when Christianity became the dominant um, um, religion in the Visayas, the use of Batek um, was discouraged. Uh, and its spiritual values was transmuted to sacred articles like the rosaries, uh, scapular, anting-anting, while the armed forces transformed the batek into, into medals. So these are some of the illustrations of the Visayans in the Boxer Codex. So these are the Visayan warriors. So the Boxer Codex described the Visayas as used to tattoo their bodies with very elegant elements and symbols and with such order, symmetry, and coordination that elicit admiration from those who see them. The most tattooed Visayans were usually warriors and leaders. So the Spani Spaniards called them pintados or painted people. Another illustration is this one, the Visayan Society. So the Boxer Codex documented a folklore among the Visayas that a bird peg or on a bamboo floating on the sea, splitting it to and coming forth, the first man and woman created simultaneously and equally. They also had stratifications in society, the Datu class or the double man, the Timawa or commoners, and Olipon or slaves. So another illustration from the Boxer Codex is the Visayan couple. So women wore multicolored striped dress made of cotton. They also wore taffeta and damask textile from China. As a symbol of nobility, women wore crowns made of jewels, uh, crowns made of Chinese tinsel or simply garlands made of roses and flowers from the garden. So lastly, another Visayan couple in gold. So a number of Visayans were gold artisans who do filigree work skillfully. So they adorn their bodies with gold accessories such as golden chains and cloth, fastener, even, uh, even the Turkish-like turban for young men locally called podong had strips of gold. So these are excerpts from the translation of the Boxer Codex by, edited by Donoso in 2016 as published by Anvil. So the involvement of the Quincentennial commemoration to the national costume. So for the National Quincentennial Committee, um, the Mavivas design of Miss Grace national costume would um, undoubtedly be educational with the country gearing up in its preparation to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the victory at Mactan. Um, Antonio uh, Pigafetta, the chronicler of the Magellan Elcano expedition, uh, reached the Visayas in 1521, described the Visayans as tattooed people. So right after the Miss Universe 2018 National Costume Competition, Last December 10, 2018, the National Quincentennial Committee Secretariat wrote Ms. Catriona Gray inviting her to attend the launching of the Quincentennial Commemorations in the Philippines on December 21, 2018. So here's the letter of the signed by Dr. René Escalante, the chairman of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines to to Miss Universe Catriona Gray inviting her to 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 the launching of the Quincentennial commemorations. So unfortunately, hindi siempre nakarating si Catriona dahil during this time is under na siya ng Miss Universe organization. 
So in the in the letter also we the national the NQC recognized the the importance of the costume to the values to the the importance of the costume to the values of the quincentennial commemorations. So with the assistance of the Philippine Embassy in Bangkok, Thailand, the P and the Philippine Airlines first, the costume was transported back to the Philippines in time with the kickoff of the quincentennial commemorations. So here is the letter of Ambassador Bernardo Arabon to Dr. Escalante, uh, stating that informed nila si yung trainer ni ni Catriona regarding the sa proposal na hiramin yung costume ni Catriona. So the bodysuit and the accessories arrived in the Philippines on December 20, 2018, while the lantern arrived at 2 o'clock a.m. of December 21, 2018. So the NHCP conservators immediately made necessary actions to assess the costumes and do the immediate interventions to safeguard and repair the costume in time for the launching, which is also on the same day. So the, the costume, particularly yung lantern, arrived in a very bad condition. So karamihan is busted yung lights, tanggal yung mga pukpuk sa gilid. Siguro ano, uh, after the show, minadali itong irepak. So for the body suit, there are some loose beads. So according to the designer, to Gerson, um, the costume is not uh, meant for a long public exhibition. So hindi nila inaasahan, hindi inaasahan ng team ni Catriona na i-display ito for, pub for public at ma-appreciate uh, appreciate ng isang national cultural agency. So akala lang nila it's only for one day use, pang isang araw lang talaga. And they were very sur surprised na nalaman nila na i-display dito sa NHCP. So the costume was first exhibited during the launching of the 2021 Quincentennial Commemorations in the Philippines last December 21, 2018 at the National Historical Commission of the Philippines Fourth Floor Function Hall. So later, it was transferred to the lobby, to the NHCP lobby for public viewing in time for the 2018 Rizal Day Commemoration. So it was again open to the public for the first leg of the Quincentennial Lecture Series entitled Tattooing in the Life of Our Ancestor with Professor Xiao Chu as the, as the speaker. So here are some of the photos during the launching. So ito yung unveiling ng, ng logo ng Quincentennial, the iconic 500 logo. And then ito yung costume na naka-display siya sa function hall. So here is uh, Dr. Escalante with Professor Xiao Chua and yung trainer ni Catriona na si Architect Bendia. So ayan. So from the NHCP after the first Quincentennial Lecture Series, uh, it was transferred to the Bella Vista Hotel in Lapu-Lapu City in line with the second Quincentennial Lecture Series and the 2021 QCP Stakeholders Meeting in Visayas Leg. So the lecture was delivered in Cebuano by Dr. Jose Eliezer Versales, entitled The World of Lapu-Lapu. So the third exhibit for the costume was in the or the Oriental Hotel in Leyte in time for the Leyte Landing Commemoration. So Dr. Rolando Morinaga served as the speaker for the third leg of the Quincentennial Lecture Series. So ayan, uh, here are some of the photos kung paano siya in-exhibit. This one is in the Oriental Hotel and then Another one is the display to sa University of the Assumption sa San Fernando City, Pampanga, in line with the National Conference on Lantern Studies. So materials assessment by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. So based on the assessment of the materia Materials Research Conservation Division of the NHCP, the national costume is made of two general pieces, the bodysuit, and the lantern backdrop. So the bodysuit consists of sheer stretch bodysuit embellished with blue and red Swarovski crystals, crystals, Swarovski beads adhered to with glue 
So the pintados pattern was sublima sublimation printed on the sheer stretched material and traced with faceted beads. So the suit was has a zipper on the back and on the calves. So a silk satin stylized loincloth is worn under the traditional brass tiboli belt helet tahu. So 19 brass bangles on varying sizes and shapes were worn on each, each wrist. And so according to the Mavibas, during their uh, immersion sa community sa Lake Cebu, talagang may meanings yung mga sinusuot na brass bangles on each uh, on each uh, wrist. So according ni to the Bobby Pascoli na sa magkabila dapat is parehas lang din. So meron din yang ano bilang. So the 5 in, 5 inch platform. So this is an uh, a photo of the uh body suit uh, na nag na material characterization ng at sinusukat ng MRCD. So, here's a closer photo of the Swarovski beads na naka-tattoo pattern. So, the 5-inch platform shoes in the gladiator style were worn with the costume. The tie-high shoes are decorated with traditional patterns and textiles and secured using buckles at the back. So the headdress used is also a traditional Tiboli two pieces joined together composed of a hand-carved wooden comb with mirrors and a cascading bead decoration worn on top of a hair bun. So ito yung photograph ng, ng headdress ni Catriona ng Tiboli inspired headdress na approximately almost 1.5 kilos yung bigat. So the movable lantern backdrop is two-faced. So the front features the backlighted parole design made of the tin fiber resin inspired by the Christmas lanterns of Pampanga. The tin fiber resin is attached to a circular metal armature. So the back side features a canvas painting in vignettes in Philipp of Philippine history bordered by a baybayin of the national anthem. So the painting is attached with Velcro on the armature. So the edges of the pattern of the lantern is bordered by a traditional pukpuk featuring scrolls and arabesque. So the lantern, yung parol, eh, weights uh, approximately 50 kilograms according to MRCD, including the elaborate lighting mechanism. So the beaded body suit, yung tattoo, uh, yung basso eco inspired uh, body suit, weighs uh, one kilogram. So the brass belt, uh, three kilograms. The headdress is, you know, 1.5 kilograms. And the boots to totals four kilos. So a total weight of 10 kilos, including the accessories. So overall, the entire ensemble is more or less nasa 60 kilograms, including yung, ano nga, yung, uh, yung parol sa likod. So the Tivoli elements utilize uh, traditional materials and techniques, while the lantern is completely modern, both in materials and construction, having used fiberglass, sheets instead of paper for durability. So the painting at the back of the lantern utilized oil paints on heavy canvas attached via Velcro straps. So the brass popo design also used a traditional technique. The boots were made with dyed leatherette and embroidered strips. So upon transporting the components of the body suits and accessories were shipped and uh, packed individually inside its original suitcase while well, the lantern was packed in a special crate made of galvanized iron to minimize damage handling. So to conclude, the national costume of Miss Universe 2018 Catriona Gray embodies one of the themes of the National Quincentennial Committee 
wants to promote the rich culture of the early Filipinos. So this is aside from commemorating the victory at Mactan, the Philippine part in the first circumnavigation of the world, and the introduction of Christianity. So the NQC also aims to promote the rich pre-colonial history of our country. The NQC wants to reset the mindset of the Filipinos by highlighting our early, early history and depart from the textbook knowledge that we were discovered by Magellan by visualizing our ancestors through the national costume of Miss Universe 2018, Catriona Gray. So before I end this presentation, I invite everyone to watch the seven-minute promotional video by the National Quincentennial Committee regarding the importance of the national costume of Miss Universe 2018, Catriona Gray, to the Quincentennial Commemorations. sa inyo ng damit sa depiksyon ng mga mandirig mang Bisaya na matatagpuan sa Boxer Codex noong 1590. Ang mga batay ko kota 2 ay tulad ng mga anting-anting ng proteksyon ng kaluluwa ng mandirig pa mula sa kasamaan at kumakatawan din sa kakitingan, takumpay at kapangyarihan ng ating mga bagani. At para naman sa Mindanao, ang kalinangan ng mga luma na tiboli na ipinahayag ng kanilang mga habing tinalak na ang mga disenyo ay binubuo nila mula sa kanilang mga panahini. Ang disenyong bate at mga abubot na tiboli ay dinisenyo rin ni Dema Vivas habang ang bota naman na nagtataglay ng mga habing Mindanaoan ay dinisenyo ni Jojo Bragay sa tulong ni Artel Presentacion. Sa likuran ng kanyang kasuotan ay isang bomba ng pinagsaluhang kasaysayan at kalinangan ng mga katutubo, muslim at kristyano sa tradisyon ng mga obra ni Botong Francisco at nagtataglay ng mga imahe ng pahiyas. Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazaret, Sampahita, Kulintang, Bayanihan, Moriones, mga eksena sa dinagyang, trahedya at katapangan sa mga obra, wali-wali, butanding, jeepney, pandango sa ilaw, Singkil, Tinalak, Sinulog, Haribon, Gigantes, Mascara, South Sea Pearls, Bulkang Mayon at Bulkang Taal, Ilog sa ilalim ng lupa, mga nakaligtas sa Yolanda, Alabao, Mayo sa Banawe, Chocolate Hills, Masjid di Mauco o mas kilala bilang Pink Mosque, Bulol at Manunggul Jar. Gayun din, ang limandaang taon ng kagitingan at tagumpay mula sa labanan sa maktan ni Nalapu-Lapu hanggang sa partisipasyon ng kababaihan sa pagtinding para sa kalayaan tulad ni na Gabriela Sila at Tandang Sora, ang pagbubuo ng nasyon sa pamamagitan ng mga sinulat at eroismo ni Jose Rizal at ng himagsikat Pilipino na sinimulan ng katipunan at tagbunsod ng ating proklamasyon ng kalayaan mula sa tatlong daang taong kolonialismo sa kawit kamite at ang pagwawagayway ng ating pambansang Manila. Nakapaligid sa obra ay ang disenyong baro na mga simbahang ipinagmamalaki bilang UNESCO World Heritage Sites. 
gawang disenyo sa kukuk o brass metal craft ni Tomas Ramirez ng Pampanga. Nakapaligid din ng ilang kataga mula sa ating pambansang awit sa baybay. Lupang hinira, duyan ka ng magitig, sa manlulupig, di ka pasisiyin. Sa dagat at bundok, sa simoy, at sa langit mong buhag. Si Justin Aliban ang siyang pangkalatang nag-ayos sa istilo ng pambansang kasuotan na ipinambato ni Catriona. Sa pagpapakita ng laman at samaktan at sa itsura ng ating mga ninuno bago tumating ang mga Espanyol, lalo na ang mga batik ng mga pintados ayon sa Boxer Codex, maging ang pagpapakita ng ilang elementong Christian ay sinalamin na ng kasuotan na ito ni Catriona ang diwa ng pagunita sa kinsentenaryo o limandang taon ng kagitingan at tagumpay sa maktan, ang pagpapakilala ng kristyanismo sa Pilipinas at ang unang pag-ikot ng tao sa mundo sa 2021. Kaya naman, ang National Quincentennial Committee ay sumulan tagad kay Catriona isang araw matapos ang isuot ang kasuotan upang ipakita ito sa mga Pilipino. Sa tulong ng Pambansa Komisyong Pakasaysayan ng Pilipinas, Embahaga ng Pilipinas sa Thailand at ng Philippine Airlines, dali-daling na yung ang mahalagang kago upang maitanghal sa pagpapasinaya ng pangunitang pangkin centenaryo noong ikadalawampot isa ng Disyembre 2018. Dinalikan ni Catriona ang kultura at kasaysayan sapagkat nais niya sa paglakad niya sa etablado sa harap ng Taiting hindi lamang niya suot ang pangalan ng Pilipinas. Ngunit dala niya ang bigat ng mga talumay, trahedya, at higit sa lahat ang kadakilaan ng sambayan ng Pilipino. Kaya naman, sa tagumpay ni Catriona na makakonahan ng Miss Universe 2018, pinakita rin natin sa kanya ang ating pagkakaisa at pagmamahali. Mensahe ni Catriona sa bawat sasas sa kasukutan niya ito, ang pamanay pagyamanin, ang bayan ay mahalin. Ito ang Pilipinas. Mr. Cruz, I think all of our viewers now have a greater appreciation of the national costume worn by Ms. Catriona Gray. And I also hope that the people will have another opportunity to, to visit no, uh, NHCP and see the costume and see all the, the details that you discuss in your lecture. Uh, at this opportunity, I would also like to thank all of our other speakers for their enlightening presentations. We will now open the floor to questions and comments from our audience. So our Zoom attendees may continue using the chat or the Q&A function to send their questions, while our audience on Facebook may post their questions in the comments section, and the technical team will collate and forward them to our speakers. Um, may we now call back all of our speakers uh, to see if they're ready to answer the questions? Are all of the, are all the speakers here already? Let me see. Yes, I think yes. All right. Okay, so let's dive into our questions. So um, the very first question here uh, in our Q&A section comes from Mr. Harold Buenvenida. Um, he said, um, I think this is uh, this is addressed to Dr. Borinaga. Um, Mr. Buenvenida asks, I would like to ask the speaker about the Humonhon Limasawa connection and the first mass. Uh, in some books, there are confusions about where the first mass was held. A priest from Butuan contends that it was in Masawa. Can you elucidate? Many thanks and swell admiration to you. Dr. Borinaga. Thank you, uh, Sir Arnold, for the question. So about uh, the Humonhon and Limasawa link, uh, and uh, you mentioned the first mass. So. Uh, there's this issue about the uh, where the first mass was held. And I guess uh, many of you are familiar with it already. Uh, but uh, the main uh, controversy was between Mas Limasawa and uh, Butuan. But uh, more recently, there's also been uh, new arguments that the first mass might have been first held in Humonhon. So that's the 
and there's even a recent book that's uh, come out. So I guess that's the uh, link between these three. So the one between uh, Limasawa and Butuan was about the exact location given how uh, in the coordinates given by Pigafetta, okay, nine and two thirds degrees. So it uh, is in the middle of the sea. So there's uh, there's some inaccuracy, I guess, in the measurement. And uh, Sir Alec had mentioned the reason for that. So the instruments that they had were not yet as accurate as they would become. Uh, but the one in uh, Humunon, so the problem with that is that there is no mention of a mass prior to the one held in Masawa. So that's the other. It was called Masawa in uh, Pigafetta's account. And, uh, but in subsequent years, uh, uh, there's Limasawa that's been accepted by the NHCP and the previous panels as the right side of the first Easter Sunday Mass. Uh, but there's a contention that it might have been elsewhere. There's a Masao in Butuan and uh, there's a hypothesis that there might have been some other island that is no longer uh, extant today. So I guess that's the only comments I can provide so far. Thank you very much, Dr. Borinaga. Um, our next question, I think, is addressed to the three uh, members of the team from NQC. Uh, Ms. Nervis, Mr. Heredilla, and the attorney, uh, attorney <laughs> architect, Villegas. Um, the question is from an anonymous attendee, and he or she asks, um, why is it that the exact locations of the route of the Magellan Elcano expedition are not being added in Philippine history textbooks? How can we add these locations to our curriculum? Any of you may answer? That's wonderful, Mr. Redadila. I hope that that really pushes through and that there will be a fruitful um, endeavors after that. Um, our next question is addressed to Professor uh, Doblado. Professor Doblado, um, there's a question here. Um, how did the residents of uh, Palawan um, appreciate or react to the fact that Palawan was actually part of the itinerary of the, of the Magellan Alcano expedition? Sir, you're on mute, sir. We cannot hear your professor. We cannot hear you. I apologize. Uh, the Palawenos were actually surprised. So when I submitted the position paper to the NHCP and it was validated by the committee, then we had uh, uh, announcements on radio on on the sites. So the four municipalities uh, especially. Uh, we talked to the mayors. They were also surprised. Um, 
if you read in previous books of history, uh, if they mention Palawan, it's actually just in passing. It's it's not uh, focusing on a specific uh, uh, area. So I think the challenge there uh, for the previous researchers are they're not really versed with the with the geography or or the place. Um, so very important talaga yung paggamit ng uh, toponymy, no? toponymy and yung local knowledge of the names of old names of, of the you know, of the uh, the places. So they were surprised and gaya ng kanina na reaction, uh, even the local depth ed are asking for a, a module. So they want it to be integrated in, in teaching, especially sa grade, uh, I think grade 3, grade 4, and grade 5, they have Philippine history. Uh, it can be used in the context of localization and contextualization in teaching Philippine history uh, by using local uh, materials, local experiences. And like what I've said, uh, everybody agrees na it changes yung pre-Hispanic history of Palawan. Kasi yung focus lang lagi is Northern Palawan because of the old churches there, Kuyu, uh, Taytay, Coron, and wala sa history yung, ano, yung, yung mga Kastila sa, sa Southern Palawan. So it actually changed yung, yung narratives namin dito. And everybody was uh, excited. So it's actually showing yung, yung dynamism ng pag, uh, pagsusulat ng kasaysayan. Thank you, Professor. Actually, no, very ma very interesting idea na Actually, no, sa akin, no, na I, I consider myself a history enthusiast. No, yung idea of the cosmopolitan uh, society in uh, in Palawan during that time no, was something na parang, uy, kailangan natin acknowledge na may ganun palang level of, ano, no, of society sa Philippines during that time. Thank you very much, Professor Doblado. Um, the next question is addressed to architect Villegas. Uh, this is a very technical um, set of questions, at uh, architect. Number one, um, it's an anonymous attendee. Uh, did I hear it right that the reliefs are made of cast iron? Was this also painted over or was gloss just painted on it? Siguro yun muna yung una nating set of questions. So, kasi yung susunod na yung iba. Okay, thank you for the question. Actually, I mentioned that the bar reliefs or the sculptural reliefs are made of banded marble. So, it was the historical markers that are made of cast iron. So they're all painted and also may gloss din siya on top. So that's the answer for that. Okay po. Itong next question related kahit pa paano dun sa, sa earlier question. Now, what responsibility is demanded from the locality where the marker is placed? May we know the reason of those localities who preferred not to claim their markers? Mm. The main responsibility of the local uh, government units is actually maintaining the historical markers or the markers and the sites. But also uh, part of their responsibility is to pass on uh, the knowledge about it because some of the markers needs uh, more um, information than just what is written on the historical markers. Like in the case of Maguindanao, uh, the Maguindanao marker is actually based in Cotabato City. So um, uh, the tourism or the local tourism office have the responsibility to uh, to explain these parts to the locals, to the tourists. So we also ask them to um, to include it in their tourism plan. So that's their responsibility. And um, have they answered all the questions? Oh, yes, yes. No one. Okay. Answered them architect, really, I guess. Um, I, no, sorry, my, my remaining question. Why were uh, the other uh, yeah. uh, local governments did not uh, attempt to get their markers? Oh. Actually, I haven't mentioned any of that, but actually there is one marker na wasn't claimed by the local government units for the reason that they don't believe that the history claimed by RN, the researchers, researches that we've done, uh, actually is aligned to their local history. So with that, we respect their um, viewpoint on that. Uh, so that's it. That's very interesting. No, may ganun pa palang perspective. No, na may na may um, 
clash or conflict between um, their local history as they understand it, no, and and as presented by by researchers, no. Very interesting. I hope that gets to be discussed, no, para stretch out natin yung yung differences na yan. Um, our next question is for Mr. Jerwil Cruz. <laughs> for Jerwil, mo kung marami interested dito sa national costume ni um, Miss Catriona Gray, no. Um, an anonymous attendee is asking, um, is it the right time for the national government, specifically the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, to initiate and assist our delegates as uh, in beauty pageant as they are ambassadresses of goodwill, sharing the multicultural uh, state of the Philippines? Actually, uh, Sir JP and the Senate I think um, it's better left to the to the organization that handles the brand to which our beauty queens are competing. So I think the national costume, the designing of the national costume, should be left to the to the creative minds of the designers. So I know na aware naman sila sa cultural nuances sa Pilipinas and nagre-research naman sila just like yung costume ni Catriona which is very authentic dahil nag-immerse talaga si na Gerson sa mga communities so, kung saan nila pinuha yung uh, yung mga design ng costume I see okay so pero kung may lalapit naman na ano na, na designer sa NHCT for help ano naman no? open naman kayo for in assisting them Yes, uh, actually we are welcoming everyone to our office, especially kung nagre-research sila dahil we can actually guide them on the uh, uh, proper information na gusto nila i-imply doon sa mga costumes na dinedesign nila. Nako, uulanin ka ng request, Mr. Cruz. <laughs> dahil dyan. Alright, um, our next question is for Dr. Borinaga. Medyo contentious to Dr. Borinaga, pero I believe you're you're very, very intelligent enough to answer this one. Um, if Filipinos by blood were charitable, humanistic, and among other inherent values enshrined, why is it during the time of unfortunate event in summer later during the typhoon? I think this is high, the high, high end or the Yolanda Typhoon, there is a semblance of individualistic and different image or color of politics simply because it is a baluarte of contrapartido, um, which appeals to one's provincialism. That's the first question, sir. Um, the second question is, what can you say on the juxtaposition or paradoxes of Filipino culture as a Visayan historian? Uh, it is also part of the fortunate and misfortunate narrative of the land of Iwata or the land of the dead. So that's the question. Those are the questions, sir. Thank you, sir, uh, for the question. Uh, or uh, thank you. Uh, well, when it comes to uh, Haiyan, so uh, I guess uh, you're referring to the color coding that transpired. So how the relief goods were distributed along uh, party lines or uh, among uh, allies. So uh, indeed, that's true. Uh, but there's also uh, a continuity to pre-colonial times. So when you say provincialism, so that had indeed been the case even before. So in the presentation, I mentioned how there was uh, slave sacrifice, there was raiding. So this was done uh, to the target communities who were outside one's own uh, clan or one's own uh, confederation. So there were lists of confederations there, the Arayas, the Ilagines, there were others that might not have been named. Uh, but it's apparent in the uh, the markings of the PINQC. Uh, so there were indeed uh, alliances between uh, Masawa and Butuan and Bai Bai and some of the nearby islands. And even within Leyte, there were also divisions between perhaps Bai Bai and uh, Masawa. So that's that's been there since before. Only that uh, with uh, Christianization, Hispanization, so the clans had been transformed. So the loyalties perhaps became smaller or it became directed towards the missionaries. So uh, 
we can uh, discount uh, provincial so called provincialism that has been there since uh, before. Pero in the case of Yolanda, I guess the main difference was that uh, it was now based on perhaps political dynasties or the uh, alliance between the barangay captain and the mayor or the recipient of the the recipient household and whether they were supportive of the barangay captain. Um, but there was also sharing. So even in the distribution of looted goods, of your mga provisions so that was shared across uh, community lines or family lines. So you can also discount that continuity with pre-colonial times and perhaps that value that when there's these catastrophes, these are the great equalizers. Ito yung makakapatag and as mentioned, ang, uh, meaning that the Visayans attributed to Makapatag was the equality of divine justice. So but there was a notion that uh, these are part of our life. Okay? We are in a hazard prone environment. And what can you do when these things happen? So all you can do is to share. Okay? But there's no more rich. There's no more poor. The society has been flattened. And uh, how you, do you survive? So you help each other. So I guess that's also a carryover from those uh, pre-colonial at times. Question. Yeah, which also explains then kung bakit nag-shift Dr. Borinaga, no, yung nilalagay nating significance sa mga places and events na ito, no? Yes. Okay. Saka yung mga so, event, extreme events din. That's right, that's right. Thank you very much. Um, Our next question is for Professor Doblado. Professor, um, this is from Anonymous Attendee. Um, are there any documents or what basically happened to Palawan in between the time of the Magellan Elcano expedition and uh, the arrival of the of the colonizers uh, during the time of Legazpi. Um, uh, what happened during the interim period? Uh, interim period, uh, basically uh, it continued because Palawan was originally part of the Sultanate of, uh, of Borneo and then it was transferred to the Sultanate of Sulu. So you have actually two areas, yung areas that were colonized, Christianized by uh, by the Spaniards coming from the Visayas. Actually, Northern Palawan, no, heavily Christianized. Yeah, you have Kuyu, you have Taytay, -tay, and they were act, uh, they were being governed, administered through I think Iloilo or Antique, and then uh, the rest. So you have El Nido, and then you have Rojas, Pababa ng Puerto Princesa, down to Balabac. It's part of the the sultanate. So um, mm. basically, uh, the Moros were collecting uh, uh, paramitan or taxes from the local inhabitants at that time, and uh, nagkaroon ng mga what you call uh, Moro uh, raids, uh, lalo na sa northern uh, Palawan because it was uh, dati kasi they collected also from from this ano, from these uh, uh, communities. So, nahati nga, you have yung Paragua at saka Paragua Sur. Yung Paragua, that's Northern Palawan. And then you have Paragua Sur, which is Southern Palawan, uh, inhabited by the by the uh, unchristianized and then by the Moros, no, under the control of the Moros. Nagkaroon lang na expansion sa Southern Palawan with, or effective control sa Southern Palawan with the establishment of Puerto Princesa uh, during 18, in 1872. So that's what happened in in the interim. So parang asyong, it's like a blank slate because it's part of what we call the the Sultanate of of uh, Sulu. Wow, that's very interesting. No, para maganda siyang gamin topic ng isang extensive webinar din, ano, Professor. Thank you very much, yeah. Professor Doblado. Um, our next question is for the group of um Alec, uh, Juvelin, and the uh, architect Villegas. Um. Would the markers be covered by multi-year budget allocation to maintain them? Uh, um, Michael Angela Yoder said that he has been to Baler in 2016 and some markers of NHCP were not maintained, including the one in the mini plaza. Um, I'll answer that for the team. So uh, the NHCP ones, uh, 
the marker is transferred or turned over to the local uh, government units or the stakeholders, it is the responsibility of the end user to actually maintain it. So we don't cover the maintenance after that. So um, actually there are over 1,000 markers in the Philippines, so we couldn't cover all of that. And even in um, restorating, uh, in, in, even in our restoration projects, once we restore structure, it's the responsibility of the end users to maintain it and take care of it. I see. Architect, ito may follow-up question. Any update daw po on the quincentennial marker in Kabalian, Southern Leyte, known as Abarian? Um, so Okay, thank you very much for clarifying that, Alec. Um, I think we have uh, two more questions left. Um, this one is from Michael Angelo Yoder, and anyone from NQC, NHCP can answer this. Um, is it correct that the local research council or entity can decline to accept the research that the NHCP conducted, even if based on evidence and scholars, vetted the said NHCP research or information? Indeed, you're right, Alec. No, because you really are stakeholders of, of that marker in that essence, diba? So their, their views on that matter should also be considered. Thank you. Ato, yung last uh, question, ko combine ko na, and light na lang yung question na to. <laughs> um, number one, first part ng question ay, um, available po ba sa portal ng NQC ang lahat ng webinars, ang PIQC, and available po ba ang souvenir items like polo shirts, umbrellas and calendars, at kung meron man, saan daw po sila pwedeng makakuha? Hello po. Uh, with regards to the souvenirs of the National Consentinial Committee, actually, 
they are produced for a limited time, especially during uh, the 2021 presidential commemoration of the Philippines. Though uh, these are free, uh, they are limited. So we cannot uh, give everybody the polo shirts, uh, the memorial markers. Uh, unfortunately, guys, we cannot give you these souvenirs. Ayun. Uh, for, uh, with regards to the uh, lectures, online lectures of the National Quincentennial Committee and even the, uh, this PIQC, uh, everybody can have access to our lectures. Just visit the uh, NQC official website. Uh, you may also view the Facebook page of NQC. Actually, uh, uh, all our lectures are, are being recorded. So just visit our website and our Facebook pages. So actually, uh, guys, uh, the NQC web website, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, is full of uh, learning materials, not only documentaries, not only lectures. There are uh, interactive map about the Philippine route of the Magellan Elkan expedition in the Philippines 500 years ago. Uh, there are animated images uh, of our pre-colonial ancestors uh, and many more. So just visit our website. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Ms. Nervous. Thank you. So this has been a really fruitful afternoon uh, and we surely learned a lot from our panel of experts. From the article of Mr. Robert Kuti, we learned the importance of verifying sources and of the correct use of data and analysis to avoid creation of quote-unquote myths and the propagation of misinformation. We have to be conscious of this because from the mouth of a respected authority, even unverified information is accepted without question as fact. Meanwhile, Dr. George Emmanuel Borinaga's lecture illuminates for us the early Visayans' view of Pomonhon Island as a sacred land and how its significance for, our, for the early Visayans shifted or developed over time. Dr. Borinaga also showed us how the early Visayas' belief systems allowed them to view the members of the Magellan Elcano expedition as returning relatives. But this view also shifted over time as they fought to regain their control or their pre-colonial culture, but eventually settled to an accommodation or acceptance of this newer culture as part of their survival and adaptation. On the other hand, Professor Michael Angelo Doblado's discussion on the contacts and encounters of the East and the West in Palawan in 1521 shows us that some of the people living in Palawan during that time were cosmopolitan with ties to the various trade centers in the region. The members of the Magellan Elcano expedition witnessed the bravery, nobility, generosity, and most especially uh, the kindness you know, and the friendship offered by the people living in Palawan during that time. And um, from the team of um, architect Janisa Villegas, Ms. Jubilee Nervis, and Mr. J uh, Joseph Alec Heredila, um, they highlighted the efforts of the NQC in making information related to the quincentennial commemorations, making them more accessible to the people, not just in the Philippines, but around the world. In doing so, many people have become and continue to become aware of the significant role of the Philippines in the first circumnavigation of the world. Through the marking of 34 historic sites, we know more now about what happened to the members of that expedition after the Battle of Mactan and how our ancestors interacted with them. And last, but not certainly the least, Mr. Jerwell Cruz enlightened us on the pre-colonial influences that were integrated in the national costume of 2018 Miss Universe, Miss Catriona Gray. Those who helped design and create the national costume relied not only on their imagination, but on a strong foundation of research and interpretation. So at this point, um, we would like to present certificates of appreciation to our speakers. Can you allow me to read the text of the certificates? So these um, certificates of appreciation are awarded to the following. Robert Kuti, George Emmanuel Borinaga, PhD, Michael Angelo Doblado, Juvelin Nervis, Joseph Alec Heredila, architect Janisa Villegas, and Jerwil Cruz for their presentations in the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference Session 9, entitled Year 
of Filipino pre-colonial ancestors special papers. Um, on December 15, uh, via Zoom webinar, this session is co-convened with the National Museum of the Philippines and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. The National King Centennial Committee was created through Executive Order Number no. 55, Series of 2018, to prepare the country in commemorating the, the 500th anniversary of the victory at Mactan, the Philippine part in the first circumnavigation of the world, and other related events. The Philippine International King Centennial Conference is also in solidarity with the year, sorry, with the year of Filipino pre-colonial ancestors and the Philippine Spanish Friendship Day. Given this 15th day of December 2021, signed by Dr. Rene R. Escalante, Executive Director, National King Centennial Committee, Chairman, National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and Chief Convener, Philippine International King Centennial Conference. So thank you very much once again to our uh, esteemed speakers. Uh, let's give them a virtual round of applause. Thank you very much. With that, we end the session nine of the Philippine International King Centennial Conference. It is now 4.44 p.m. Philippine Standard Time. We invite everyone to catch the last session of the PIQC tomorrow, December 16, 2021 at 1 p.m. entitled Manifesting and Attesting, or rather Asserting, a Filipino Point of View. It will be convened by the University of the Philippines Department of History. We also would like to invite everyone to join us for the closing program of the PIQC on December 17 at 4 p.m. You can catch the live stream on the Facebook pages flash on your screen or join us here in the Zoom at the first come first serve basis by registering at www.nqc.gov.ph/piqc. This has been your moderator John Paul Egalin Aguilera from Project Saisai. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.